Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Is that mic on? Is on? Okay. Can you all hear me? Cool. Okay, so um, we have all the speakers here now so we can get started. And um, I just wanna thank you all so much for joining us today. I know everybody is really busy. Um, we are observing Youth Justice Action Month as we do every year. Um, this is an opportunity to raise uh, awareness about the impact of the justice system on our youth and, and um, our role in taking action. So what we're gonna do today is um, we're gonna have a mingling exercise um, after I go over some of the housekeeping um, items and then we're gonna have a pretty cool icebreaker. Um, so one of the things I'd like to tell you is that we do have restrooms on this floor as well as a break room that has beverages and uh, snacks in the vending machine. Um, there is no break during the session. As you know, it's from one to four, so please get up and do what you need to do. Um, we won't be offended. Um, and then um, there are some other um, safety issues that we also wanna discuss. So you'll see on these screens um, some of the things that you have to adhere to. Um, the first thing I would like to t tell you is that we do have a Wi-Fi password um, that you can sign on to our uh, network. Um, as you can see, if you hear any alarms in the building, you should begin evacuation. Um, if there are no alarms, this is the case, you should be alert and ready to evacuate if the alarm sounds. Please pay attention to that. Um, they would like you to stay calm and gather outside uh, the building, taking all your personal belongings. Do not take any beverages or food. Um, unless otherwise directed, exit uh, to the nearest stairwell, which is uh, the stairwell right here, but there's also one in the back of the room. Um, we refer to this in the invite as main ballroom, uh, the main conference room, but we also call it the ballroom because of the beautiful chandeliers that we have here. Um, um, again, uh, exit near the uh, nearest stairwell, uh, move away from the building and follow instructions uh, of the team that will be on the ground. Um, they will notify you when the building is clear and you can re-enter. If you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. Okay, so moving on, um, I told you a little bit about our uh, icebreaker. So for YJAM, the theme of YJAM is justice is. They picked that theme because they wanted to hear from youth and families impacted by the justice system, and they wanted to know what their thoughts on were on justice. And so these are some of the things that we heard from folks over the last couple of years. Um, as you can see, they're saying justice is trust, justice is well-being, justice is mental health. So we want you to participate in this icebreaker, and I am going to let our co-moderator, Diamond Lewis, tell you about it. Thanks, Anna. Can everybody hear me? Good afternoon, everybody. So what we're going to do for our icebreaker is we can go to the Mentimeter now. So um, if you ever heard me speak, then you probably know what a Mentimeter is. It's my favorite thing to do ever. Um, so you'll have pieces of paper, and also you can use either the QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to menti.com and type in the code that's either on your piece of paper or also on the screen. Um, the first thing that'll pop up is just gonna be a screen that just says YJAM panel icebreaker. Um, and you'll see a thumbs up button, I believe. Just hit the thumbs up, just letting us know that you're um, there and you're able to participate. And so what'll happen is we can go to the next slide now. You'll have the opportunity to um, use a couple of words. I think you can do up to three words um, and answer the prompt justice is, just telling us what justice means to you. And it'll create a word cloud that'll come up on the screen. Um, so hopefully we'll start to see some pop up here. And like I said, I think you'll have three um, chances to enter different words and we'll see. And then as we're talking and moving around and during our meet and greet, um, we'll kind of get into, there they go. <laughs> we'll kind of get into exactly what justice means for all of us, okay? So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Anna. All right. Wow, you guys are quick. Um, so yeah, so this is um, 
so right now we're going to do a, basically a meet and greet or a mingling or whatever you want to call it. You can, you know, talk to the panelists. You can mingle with um, some of your colleagues, um, and that will we will do that till about 1:30, and then we'll um, start the formal part of the panel discussion. So thank you again, and yeah. You may commence mingling. <laughs> So we invite you, if you want to meet any of the panelists before we start, they're right here and they're going to come out and talk. Hello, everyone. We're going to get started now. If you all could just have a seat, please. We're going to get started. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to invite Liz to the podium to give her welcoming remarks. Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for being here today. I am really excited uh, that we're able to gather, and I know you all have very busy schedules, and I just want to thank so many of you for being here. Um, a number of my colleague component heads are here, Justin Locke, Helena Heath, Shana Vanek. Brent Cohen, and I want to thank you all for being here. I also want to thank the Coalition for Juvenile Justice and the National Juvenile Justice Network for helping us to uh, work on this. And I want to thank Diamond Lewis and um, Anna Johnson, who was just up here, uh, for pulling this together. Thank you. So ODJDP is hosting this event as part of Youth Justice Action Month. And during Youth Justice Action Month, uh, we join our partners in raising awareness and taking action on youth justice. Um, we at ODDDP have prioritized centering directly impacted young people and their families, and that's why we're here today. And so we want to hear from our amazing panelists um, about ways we can effectively partner with directly impacted youth and families. Youth Justice Action Month began in 2008. Uh, it started as uh, Youth Justice Awareness Month, and it was started by a parent, Tracy McClard, in Missouri, whose child, uh, Jonathan, was 17 and tried in adult court, placed in an adult jail, and committed suicide in the jail. She started a 5K run in her community to raise awareness about uh, what was happening in the justice system, and that has now exponentially grown across the country um, thanks to many of the organizations, um, CJJ, NJJN, and others. And it was renamed Youth Justice Action Month in 2016 because people didn't want to just raise awareness, they actually wanted to take action. And we know that OG, we know at OGDDP that taking action can actually really impact lives. So during today's conversation, you're going to hear from Mylan, Durrell, Maya, Noah, Ahmad, and Audi, and they're going to talk about um, the impact of the justice system, but even spend more time on ways that we can effectively partner with them. And then the panel discussion is going to be followed by um, comments from the audience and Q&A. And we've just been joined by NIJ Director Nancy Levine. Thank you, Nancy, for joining us. And also um, the OVC Director, Chris Moore. Thank you so much. Um, so I now have the honor of introducing um, Brent Cohen. Brent serves as the Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Justice Programs. I met Brent many years ago when he actually worked at the Department of Corrections in New York, and um, a young person and I were touring the facility, and he took us around, and it was just an amazing um, connection there. And so I'm really um, honored that Brent was uh, took time out of his busy schedule to join us today and provide remarks. I could share his whole bio with you just to say he has had a long and distinguished career in uh, the justice reform movement. And Brent, we're just really excited to have you join us and want to invite you up to share your remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. So I will uh, do my best not to overstay my welcome, um, but I, I really am 
um, honored to be able to uh, provide some some opening remarks before turning it over to this incredible panel. Just really want to thank Liz, you for your leadership. We met years ago, um, and uh, as Liz said, and was just at the time such a titan in the field and continues to be an advocate for youth justice and for young people uh, and had the pleasure of continuing to meet Liz in different iterations throughout the years and to be working together right now in these seats is really just such a such a distinct honor and um, extremely proud than to be able to do that. Um, I also very much want to thank the panelists today. Uh, thank you for sharing your insights, your advice, your recommendations, your perspective, and for your leadership in using your personal experiences to drive us towards a more effective, a more fair, uh, a more equitable system, um, one that serves the needs of all those who come in contact with the justice system, regardless of how you come into contact. And I know you have a, a wide variety of experiences, and I'm just so grateful uh, for your leadership, so thank you. I, I want to take a few minutes and share a bit about my own experience, what drove me to this work. Um, and for me, it started when I was a kid, particularly in, in middle school and high school, and watching my friends cycle in and out of the juvenile justice system. Um, I grew up in a place where we, we actually had the worst achievement gap in the state, uh, where white and Asian students typically did quite well and black and Latino students did not. Uh, and that was reflected in graduation rates. That was reflected in uh, matriculation into college, and it was also reflected in exposure to violence. Um, and so I was sort of on this periphery of, gun, of, of gang violence growing up. Never so close, never quite in the middle, fortunately never got into any serious trouble, um, but certainly uh, close enough to see the toll that it took on those who I was close to, uh, and the toll that it took on those around me. In my, my sophomore year of high school, I remember it was a, a vice principal, a school administrator, pulled me into the office with about 20 other kids, wanted to search our backpacks, something had transpired, I, who knows what, went through our bags, and when he didn't get anything on me, I remember him looking at me and being like, I didn't get you today, but I'm going to get you kicked out of here. And it was, it was an enlightening experience for me, it was an enlightening interaction. That was when I first started to realize the impact that systems and system actors had on young people and other vulnerable populations. Um, and that was that moment, right? That experience plus the experience of watching my friends come back often worse off than when they went in through the juvenile justice system that led me down this path. First through teaching and then later transitioning into, into CJ work. You know, it was fortunate. I was fortunate, right? But, 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 the, but, but, but by the grace of God go I, right? Um, I was fortunate that I didn't get caught in one of those moments. And so I watched as my career and my life went in almost opposite or at least separate directions for a period of time than those who I had grown up with. And it sparked for me that desire to change the systems that impact people's lives. And so, you know, very briefly, some of my past work here, the first time I was at OJP, was really focused on the type of things that I'm sure our panel is going to be talking about today in terms of juvenile justice and how do we, how do we implement continuum-based continuums of care to hold young people accountable, to improve youth outcomes, to improve overall safety and health of communities, and to do it in a way where we're also reducing incarceration of young people. Those things all happen in tandem, and when they do, we are better off because of it. And so that's a lot of what the work I was doing before, and I know it's so much of the leadership of, of Liz and the team here at OJJDP is focusing on now, building safer communities and improving youth outcomes at the same time. Now, the, the, the core of today's panel is so much about having directly impacted people at the table. And I just want to highlight a bit, in addition to my own experience growing up, that throughout my career I've worked with people who have experienced and persevered despite unimaginable loss of a loved one. I have worked with people who have endured and succeeded in spite of system harm. Worked with people who have been involved in either the adult or the juvenile or both justice systems sometimes because of terrible decisions they've made, 
not sugarcoating that at all, but they've had to overcome seemingly insurmountable odds when they've been released from prison or incarceration or otherwise finished their sentence. And sometimes I've worked with people who fit into all three of those categories because we don't live siloed linear lives. And so while everyone's experience is different and the ways they come in contact with the justice system can be different, especially depending in part on, on how they come in contact and what that experience looks like, I find myself continually learning from people who have been directly impacted by the system, continually turning back to insights and, and experiences that have been shared with me by those who have experienced it firsthand. And at the end of the day, the justice system isn't some conceptual thing that we get around and just talk about. It's not a hypothetical, right? Let's have a scholarly conversation at the 3,000 foot level. It is a very real concrete thing that impacts people's lives for, the, for better or for worse. And so how it operates, how the system actors inside of it, whether we're talking about police or defense counsel or prosecution or probation officers, detention center staff, how they operate, how the system operates, it impacts people's lives. It can be the difference in helping a young person turn their lives around and become a contributing member of their community, a safe community, an inspiration, a role model to others, or pushing them deeper into the system. It can be the difference between a crime survivor or a family member getting closure and feeling safe versus feeling like they're being re-traumatized by the system that is supposed to respond and protect them. And so the way that we know what's working and what isn't working, or at least a significant way, certainly we have research and we have data, and that is critical. Those are critical elements, and so much of the work that we do at OJP is rooted in evidence and research and data. And that also includes hearing from the lived experiences of people who have been impacted by those systems directly. And so I am just so grateful for the intentional way that OJJDP has centered the voices and experiences of young people and families who have been directly impacted by the system. And again, I'm grateful for the panel for offering their experiences, their advice, their leadership as you all have this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brent. Um, so now we're going to jump right in. We're going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves. Mylan, we're going to start with you. Hello. Okay, great. Um, good afternoon. It's nice to see everybody. My name is Mylan Barnes. I am 22 years old from Washington, D.C., Southeast. I'm a youth advocate um, and the youth co-chair for the State Advisory Board in D.C., and I'm very excited to be here and learn more. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Darrell Frazier, based in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm really excited to be here as well with my fellow panelists, but with all of you as well. And I'm looking forward to a robust conversation. Um, he, his pronouns, and uh, former fellow for the National Juvenile Justice Network, and I also serve on the Emerging Leaders Committee for the Maryland State SAG. And uh, yeah, I'm really to, ready to jump into the great discussion. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Maya Horsey. I'm a parent um, of a juvenile that was incarcerated, and so therefore that led me to be on the state advisory group. I sit with Darrell and a few other people that are present as, um, as well. So what brought me to want to sit on this panel is the fact that I want to bridge the gaps um, and spread awareness to rehabilitation versus punishment, and hopefully that everybody can gain a better understanding of what the parents deal with Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Noah McQueen. I'm from Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm honored to be here with all you guys today. Uh, I am a Morehouse graduate. Um, I actually have my two grandparents in the audience. If you guys want to raise and say hey. <laughs> <laughs> so what brought me to this work, uh, I was sensitive impacted from ages 14 to 18. Um, I, I currently have a few roles and titles, uh, but one is uh, sitting on the ELC as a committee member, 
uh, but also um, I run a nonprofit. Um, I work in education technology uh, for HBCUs, and also um, I am a Partnership for Inclusive Innovation uh, Fellow for Georgia Tech, so I got like four jobs. So, <laughs> but I'm honored to be here with you today, sitting on this panel uh, on this important discussion. Good afternoon. My name is Ahmad Rivisfar from Rochester, New York, and I'm a parent. Um, unfortunately, uh, the sad story is I lost a daughter in the process, and I had two kids who were kidnapped. One um, was raped and the other murdered. Um, and I've been part of uh, NECMEC, Fox Valley College, Amber Alerts trying to give back as much as I can to the communities that, that supported us for the past 34 years. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Adi. Um, I am 20 years old. Um, I came into the system as a dual case. Um, I did reside and grow up in three different states, all um, in Michigan, California, and Iowa. However, I was under the custody of one state, which is Iowa, um, and, and that's who I am. <laughs> Thank you all. So I'm going to turn it over to my co-moderator, Diamond Lewis, who has been uh, really a champion uh, in working with young people and um, making OJJDP live up to its promise of centering directly impacted young people. So Diamond, do you want to kick us off? Thank you so much, Administrator Ryan. Um, hi, everybody. Again, Diamond Lewis, Program Manager with OJJDP. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So I am going to start you all off with a couple of questions. Um, Administrator Ryan, please feel free to jump in um, with follow-ups, um, should there be any. But just to start off, um, so each of you just provided somewhat of a brief um, background um, talking about your positions and everything. So can you please expand on um, how you've been impacted by the various systems? And that can be juvenile justice, child welfare, um, the adult carceral system, um, and anyone can jump in at any time. Okay. I'm going to start it off and say that I've been impacted by many systems in good and bad ways. Um, so I would like to start, start it off like that first and not really throwing jabs or throwing any negatives. But when I was in foster care, I feel like I learned a lot about structure and love. But then on the other hand, I didn't really learn a lot about like engaging with my own family. So that was kind of the two ends to that. Um, but moving forward, when I was Title 16, um, as a young girl being charged with two uh, attempted murder charges, I didn't really know what to expect going through the system. I really thought I was just going to end up being in like federal prison for the rest of my life in a sense. Um, but then when I got down YC, it was a lot of conversations around, okay, well, they seem like they're going to go this way. So it was kind of scary. Um, but then and I ended up being committed to the system for three years of with DYS, where I learned a lot about rehabilitation and their prevention services. Um, I gained a lot of awesome mentors, such as Mama Jo, who is in the crowd right now. Parent Watch really has helped me learn a lot about advocating um, for other parents and other young people. Miss Natalie at the Achievement Center is always calling me a queen. Um, so I went from being a young delinquent, as they would call it, to being somebody who was able to help my peers navigate um, the system. Systems. And yeah, it was it was pretty cool to have that turnaround. But in the midst of that, I feel like I've seen a lot of my peers struggle because where you may be competent, others may not. Um, and a lot of things weren't comprehensive for my peers. We had like this um, score sheet that we did in our TDMs, and I was always like, like, why do we get 20 points for being in the community? I think that's a good thing. We shouldn't get negatives for that. Um, so I learned a lot of different perspectives on what we need in our community and also what victims of gun violence need, um, but I'll go into that more later as we continue to speak. But that's my brief overview. Thank you. Thanks, Marlene. And uh, kind of similar to Mylan, I was a dual system involved young person as well. I'm at an early age. My father was sentenced to 16 years in prison. My mom was 
unfortunately suffered from opioid addiction and mental health. And so she was criminalized for her conditions where, rather than being rehabilitated. So neither one of them was in my life. And I had the fortunate opportunity of being taken in through kinship care by my grandmother, but she also had to raise now the grandchildren as well. So that alone was just a challenge and a struggle where you are raising multiple children, um, also in an environment where you lack opportunities, lack resources, um, having to navigate it on your own. You know, uh, times has changed since she was younger, so a lot of the systems that were that currently exist or pre-existed, she didn't really know how to navigate and didn't really have the support to really like provide her some insight, et cetera. So, you know, we really being the oldest, I really uh, just try my best to set an example. But unfortunately, um, when you are uh, oftentimes being a target and not really seen for your potential and your gifts and the brilliance that you really possess, you know, a lot of times you can have like a, a, a negative connotation. And so, you know, really, um, unfortunately had a run in with the juvenile justice system, um, which landed me in Hickey, which is a institution in Maryland for all boys where you um, serve some time. And so I did some time there and then uh, transitioned back into community where I really started to provide and give back a lot of my time mentoring. A lot of young males predominantly, but also young young women as well, um, and became like a youth mentor, organizer, et cetera. And so we'll get into the conversation a little later around just my policy work and, and the community engagement work and stuff like that. Okay. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. So um, as I mentioned earlier, my parent, um, I only have one child. Johan, he's 20 years old. And so what brought just to expand on my my career and how that looked with me having a child that was in the system, I was in a position under the governor's office, uh, the local care team. So as a local care team coordinator, I was the hub for the whole county. So my job was to bridge, uh, wrap services around children that had mental health issues to keep them in their homes. Then I got hit with my child getting 30 years plus 30 plus 30. So I had to work on keeping children within their home and then trying to figure out within that time span how to get my child home. Not to get emotional, but. Uh, <laughs> Your know, he's my only child. Um, I went above and beyond, beyond for him because his father was incarcerated. Well, it's like, um, I would like to say I'm an overachiever um, because I showed my son, you know, with racial disparities and the stigmas that's faced on us as single black women raising, raising brown boys, um, it's kind of difficult for them to see past go. So I put myself through school single-handedly, got my master's degree, and showed your hearts that you don't have to strive the fence. Just go hard. You can get it out the mud. You can be anything that you want to be. So while I'm working, trying to serve other families to keep them in their home, my child was interacting with people to get him removed from mine. Um, the services that you all have over here, they don't have in Wakama County. When I hear Darrell speak about how he transitioned from incarceration to having programs to wrap services around him so that he could be successful. Look at him. My son went in one way and he came home another. I don't even know who my child is today. He is, he's surrounded by darkness. Um, he's always angry on paper. I'm pretty sure he has PTSD. He, I'm his natural support. He doesn't have any other natural support but me. I asked her out prior to us starting, like, I wish there was a mentorship in Wackler, McCall, Maryland that really stood on what they said. When a child transitions from a placement, they should have some type of plan in place to wrap services around them so that they could work on mental health, um, just being cognizant of what they went through, not being embarrassed by what they went through, having a voice. Um, being able to not not feel shunned because of the experience that they went through. He didn't have any of that. He, all he had was me. I, I sit on the state advisory group and I'm working on different programs 
to help other people. And every day that I walk in my own home, it's dark because of my child's spirit. And I'm hoping that by me sitting on these various boards that I'll run into somebody that can help put policies in place that they actually follow through on so that my, not just my child, but that I'm able to reach somebody else and that we can make sure these systems, you know, that people, that the gaps are actually filled, that we actually bridge in the gaps that we talk about, that we actually have some follow through. So that's why I'm here. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I went over my two minutes and I didn't, <laughs> I didn't mean, I didn't mean to get emotional. That's, that's my story. Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> I apologize in advance. I'm definitely about to go over my two minutes. Um, and I say that to say today we're going to have a lot of important conversation. Um, we're going to talk about different policies, different things we're doing in the community, um, different impact work we're, we're able to contribute. But, you know, just hearing Maya's testimony, I think throughout this time we should find a space to reflect um, and really feel and experience what she said, right? Uh, I think it's one thing to, you know, I, I, you know, we're all professionals. We go to a lot of meetings. We send a lot of panels. Um, but humanizing somebody's experience, um, first as a, as, a, as a person, but, you know, as a mom, um, as a grandparent, as a sister, as a brother, um, you know, I say system impacted, but in many different ways, we've all been system impacted. And it, it doesn't have to be direct. Um, the vicarious trauma that you get from another person um, family, otherwise, I mean, the news can be traumatic. There's a lot of things that um, you can hear and listen, and you can you can connect to somebody's story. So I just wanted to level set and uh, charge, you know, the people in this room to when you hear testimonies that you take a moment to receive them as such. Um, and, and for me, uh, and, and I'll, I'll make my space quick. My relationship with the juvenile justice system started very early. Um, uh, I, I believe that, you know, just just going off, you know, just the, the previous testimony that, you know, my, my uncle <laughs> was system impacted as a juvenile, um, you know, as a youth. Um, that, that same, you know, uncle was, you know, sentenced by the same judge that sentenced me by the same judge that sentenced my sister. And so, you know, that in Prince George's County, our, our name is very um, familiar <laughs> in those courtrooms um, as far as, you know, just, and that's a, as a family. And so I think that, you know, the first time, you know, I was in handcuffs was maybe, I think, 11 years old. And so, um, you know, I, I think that as we look at what our relationships are with the, the juvenile justice system or any system, the educational system, think about the toll that it has on families and generations um, and how that carries uh, and how that creates um, I pretty, I, I, just from the previous testimonies, I heard the brother speak about his father, how that trickled down to him. I, I think we have to really evaluate the systems and not just one, but all. Um, you know, a lot of my testimony has to do with other people. And um, I am blessed, I am privileged to be here, but I, am, I would not be here without the love and wisdom and encouragement and support of others and the collaboration of community. And also, to be honest, some of the, the the, um, the lack of support, right? Lack of support, the, the naysayers, the doubters, the people who dro drove me, um, who were in the place uh, in the system that was supposed to push me and help me and support me. Um, I think it's two-sided, right? But I think uh, it matters about the people in this room taking those um, individuals, those children, those kids, taking their lives and their success personally that pushes us, that educates us, that creates policy for them so we can be better leaders and create a better tomorrow. Well, my two daughters, one was six and the other one was eight, and my um, former wife, um, her boyfriend took them one night. There's the process in the, in the whole um, taking them first. Um, he was abusing my oldest daughter for a long time, so finally got to the point that um, he took all, both of them away. I lived in Rochester, New York at the time, and my ex-wife lived in Florida. And I used to go once a month, go visit my kids because it's the only time I could get out of work on Friday and drive straight to Pensacola, Florida, 18 hours, and get there and have 
couple of hours with the kid, and then next day I come back and go to work. Um, when uh, <clears throat> when my kids were taken on September 22nd, that was a long time ago, 1988. Um, I had no idea. I was in Rochester, went to work, nothing was going on. So I got home and my sister-in-law who lives in Pensacola, Florida, called me up and said, I saw something on the news. I think you should call the Santa Rosa Sheriff's Department. And I did. And um, they, I asked them, you know, if the two kids, Josiah and Sarah, that they have found, uh, are they my kids? Are, who they are, are they? How come I wasn't called? And they got really upset with me over the phone because I asked them why didn't I, was I called? And they told me, yes, they are, and um, I should come down to Pensacola. Uh, and it was like seven o'clock at night. There was no flight out of Rochester to Pensacola. So the next day, it was the toughest night I've ever had in my life. Uh, so the next day, I flew to Pensacola. I had no idea what to do. I had many attorneys to get custody of my kids. And one of them met me at the airport, and uh, we went to the, the DA's office. I have to tell you that the experience I had from that moment on, I mean, from that phone call that they didn't even, they didn't even look for the dad, and the mom was there, and they knew what was going on. Uh, when I got to the, uh, to the DA's office with my attorney in the, uh, the DA told me that if I would make any noise, any loud noise, that um, he is going to keep me out of the whole process. I said, this is my kid. You can't take me away. Yes, I'm an immigrant. I know I came here a long time ago, but I know my rights. There's nothing you can do about it. He got really upset with me. And my attorney told me that to keep it quiet, and I did. But he's talking about a dad who's lost kids. I mean, it was like atrocious the way they dealt with me, much less my kids. So they finally told me I could go see my kids. I see my daughter in the hospital. When I got there, um, they told me to go downstairs in the morgue to recognize my daughter, my six-year-old daughter. That's the last memory I have of her. I love that book. So, and I have to tell you that I couldn't even walk out of that up place, and my brother and my friend took me out, and I went up to see my daughter who had survived an amazing attack. Her neck was cut up. She was destroyed pretty much, but she pretended she was dead, and then the guy thought that she was, and they ran over her. She told me, she says, Dad, Sarah had a hole in her throat, an eight-year-old telling me that her sister was dead. So the whole process, so eight months later, I got custody of my kids. It was a disastrous time. I had no respect for the police, no respect for the DA. As an immigrant who trusted these people, I thought law enforcement was on my side. I was an honorable person, worked hard. I tried to follow the path everywhere I could, but that wasn't going to happen. And, and I know it's because of where I'm from. And unfortunately, in the United States of America, even though we are all our immigrants, even in our passports written where I'm from. That is not an easy thing to survive in this country with that, especially everybody is so, hate us so much for, for the propagandas out there. So it um, took me a month and a half to come back to Rochester. I couldn't even walk. I could tell you uh, a parent, when they lose a child, I, I wish, Nobody will ever have to go through that. It will destroy your life. But I had six kids. I had to take care of them, so I did. And, and that, the positive end of it, my oldest daughter was 40, just turned 44 years old. She's retiring from New York State Police. 
as an investigator for six months. Her and I have been partners in speaking. We've been part of NECMEC for a long time. And uh, because when this happened in 1988, the only person who was around was John Walsh. She had a place in Tampa. And I lived in Rochester. I had no idea who he was. So I called him, and he told me, he says, welcome to the club that nobody wants to be in, but good luck. He couldn't do anything for me. So now I could tell you, I've been part of NECMEC for a long time. Been part of Fox Valley and Amber, Amber Alert. We are making a difference. It's amazing. I told Liz when I met her on 25th, this is amazing what I see. I'm part of Team Hope, and I deal with a lot of parents who have missing kids. And I tell you, like my friends here who have felt the pain of that, I, those people do. Those who are unfortunately minorities, police officers really don't respect that much a parent who's gone through such a craziest thing ever. So um, that's what we do in Amber Alert. We teach those police officers how to be respectful to another, to a, to a parent. Um, I'm sorry, I took too long. Sorry, my throat was a little tight because hearing everybody's testimony is just a lot for me as well. I'm processing it as you guys are as well. Um, as for me, um, the, the systems that have impacted me, I know I had mentioned already, I was a dual case, so um, both the child welfare system and the juvenile justice system, um, both sides of my families were in gangs, so they were already like, for me, um, because they were known already for getting into trouble, I was already targeted. Um, the teachers were, would always watch me, like I was just kind of a person they watched out for more than others. Um, which I felt was unfair, um, and it didn't allow me to be a young individual, a kid. Um, and then I went through the whole system. I was having um, young parents. Um, my mom struggled to um, be a mother, and she struggled to love me and, and how to communicate that she loved me. Um, so because of that, I was out of the home uh, for a majority of my childhood. Um, and I, the system pretty much raised me. Um, and through that was detention centers, um, qualified residential treatment programs, mental health treatment programs, and, and so forth, shelters, foster homes. Um, and through all of that, um, I turned 19, and, and that's when I got out. And, and God blessed me and finally gave, um, gave me the love that I deserved all along. So I'm doing good. Um, however, I was, I'm still able to identify that there's other young individuals that still haven't received help, that they still don't feel that love, um, and they're still going through a lot. And so that's kind of why I'm here, um, because I don't feel comfortable even though my life has gotten better. Um, so. Thank you all so much for that. And I think, you know, just echoing uh, what Noah was saying, just humanizing, you know, these experiences. That's why we're here, you know, these aren't just statistics that we're reading or stories that we're hearing on the news. These are real people that um, are affected and their family. So and I think that speaks a lot to why we're here today. So thank you all so much for, for sharing those. So we're going to jump right into the next question. Um, and so for the sake of time, don't feel like we have to go, you know, in a line to answer, you know, so <laughs> make it, you know, we can take about, uh, you know, two or three or four responses per, per question so that we can uh, make sure that we have time for questions and answers at the end. Okay, so just wanted to throw that out there. Um, so you all, and some of you have answered this a little bit um, in your response to the last question, um, but you all are leaders right now in different organizations and your different advocacy, or, um, advocacy organizations. Um, so talk to us a little bit about what your path was to becoming involved in these organizations. And like I said, some of you have already spoken to that a little bit. Um, but the second part of that is also what recommendations do you have for other people who want to? Because we hear all the time from different young people who um, have been impacted by these systems who want to become involved or different parents who want to become involved. So what advice do you have for them um, to get involved in these advocacy efforts? 
Excuse me. Um, well, firstly, I would like to say that I've had so many awesome opportunities to grow as a young per person when it comes to my speaking engagements, learning about data. Um, when I used to work at the Department of Behavioral Health, I was an administrative assistant and also a peer. Um, so I learned a lot about data input, how to look at data charts, how to read line items and budgets. And I mean, I'm 19, 20, I'm cold with it, right? And those are the types of things that young people want. They want to be able to have those tangible skills that they can take with them to be successful. So um, I think I'm answering both questions at the same time. Um, but even in that, when I was in the juvenile detention center, I feel like I learned a lot about my peers. So when I came home, I knew like what we needed, not just myself. Because I feel like sometimes when you hear one story, you're like, oh, we just need to tailor it to look just like that. And it's like everybody has different needs. Everybody goes through different struggles. And I most definitely learned that from being able to engage with other young people who were targeted or you know, being victimized. Um, so really learning more about mental health was the biggest thing that I learned at DBH, and I'm currently using that within my role at Restoring Ivy Collective. Um, I'm a program specialist working with young women in the LGBTQIA community plus um, with, regarding uh, sex trafficking and sexual exploitation and sexual violence. Um, a lot of our young women in the community have or are prone to be at risk of these uh, disparities, and I didn't have any education on it. And so when I was down DYS, I connected with a lot of women programming, so I learned a lot about self-care and just how to uplift myself and how to uplift others. So it was a lot of different entries or gateways where I gained these different tools, and now I'm using them to help uplift other young women um, who may not feel worthy or feel that shame that, you know, you kind of gain from going through certain traumas. We're like, am I good enough to be in this room? Am I good enough to show up? Um, and I want to say that we all are good enough to be at this table, period. Um, but also, on the other hand, of how do you get into the work, it's not easy, I want to say, as a young person, because we're still in this era of people learning how to see us and how to respect us as professionals. Um, so for me, in the beginning, it was like, okay, I'll take the gift card. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, but <laughs> in the midst of that, I feel like that actually helped me learn about speaking and what I was passionate about. Um, at DYS, we had a lot of opportunities to do budget hearings. So I was off screen, but I got to advocate to the council members in my community, which made me feel seen to be able to like tell Trayon, hey, I don't feel like Blue Senior High School has the same uh, opportunities or access that Roosevelt or Wilson does. And so different aspects of just letting them know like what was working and what wasn't working within the program that made me feel really good and empowered and so I kept going and I was like the only kid showing up to it um, and I think that was because of the gift card. <laughs> um, but as we continued on, I actually gained more opportunities to like go down the Wilson building and in the midst of that, I was like, okay, I don't have any blazers and I met a lot of Mama Joes basically. They were like, you can have my blazer um, and that really helped out as well having that village or those people that are like, hey, you don't have to look or sound like others to be able to speak or advocate for what you believe in. And so um, in the midst of that, I did a lot of fellowships and internships. That's how I started off at DC Doors, which you see in my bio. I was actually at a drop-in center where I helped young people like gain access to basic needs um, when it comes to their socks, food, whatnot, and referrals. And that really motivated me. And the lady that was like of the leadership, she was like, well, I don't want you to think that you're stuck here. She was like, do you have any interest in becoming an admin? And I'm like, I've never done that before. I went to job courts to do office administration. And when I came in at first, I was like, I do not belong in the office building. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but that was what I needed. I needed that opportunity to actually learn. And we were turning in data to SAMHSA, and I was doing our quarterly inputs. And people were like, what? You're 20 doing data? And so now within the role of where I am, I'm a young professional, and I'm a young consultant, and just have to carry yourself with respect and come out and show up. So. I just, I just want to echo that. I think that is so amazing that you, one, highlighted just the transition between being a young person who was impacted and not allowing your circumstances to hold you back or to be, you know, the reason that you had to be stagnant. You actually were surrounded by individuals who gave you, who encouraged you and motivated you and told you that you can be more. And a lot of young people don't have access to that. Like, that's not a everyday thing that you get to meet individuals who pour into you and who tell you that you can go above and be more. So I just want to echo that. But um, earlier I mentioned that when I do my transition, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Maya's comment as well, when I do my transition of reintegrating back into community, I became a youth organizer. And so in the process of becoming a youth organizer, one, I just 
just want to clarify that we did not have programming or any resources that really poured into us to help us get to where we wanted to be. I had mentors who really invested in me as a young individual. They seen the potential in me before I even seen the potential within myself. So because of these mentors, because I didn't have family members who graduated high school, who were college graduates, or who were professionals, I had mentors who really seen something in me and who told me and molded me and motivated me that I could be more. So because of that, I began, you know, organizing other young people. I realized that I'm not the only young person that's going through the current issues that's going on in my community. There are actually more young people who have incarcerated parents who are growing, who's growing up in single family households, et cetera, et cetera. And so being a child of an incarcerated parent, I began um, going around my school. And so when I realized that I had a voice and people would actually begin to listen to me, all because I spoke up about just the inequities and the negative things that was happening within my school and lack of resources, I began to gain some attention. And I also encouraged other young people to do the same. So that kind of sparked off my interest in really wanting to advocate on behalf of others and really fight for justice and fight for what's right. Because I honestly knew that our current circumstances in Baltimore City growing up in the inner city urban communities that this is not what life was this is not life like this is not the end all be all that there's actually more to life than just this and so you know from there i began to do a lot of um fellowship programs, um, working at after school programs with young people. I worked in direct service for a very long time, working with other young people who were identified as troubled youth. Um, I cannot stand that term. I can't stand the term of juvenile either. But because um, these were like the, the young people who they identified that they were putting in alternative, alternative schools, et cetera, I began to want to work with those young people because nobody else wanted to. And so they began to see a difference in how these young people responded to me, how they wanted to work with me, how they saw they the attendance started to change, et cetera. But then I also realized that this is not where I know I'm the most effective, right? I do great work here. I love the young people. I want to continue to do this, but I know that I'm destined for more. And so I got involved in policy. And one thing that I realized is that within policy, um, they lack diversity. We, they didn't have a lot of young um, lobbyists that were going to Annapolis, Maryland to really advocate on legislation that was impacting young people, whether it was in the education system, trying to reform the school to prison pipeline, or whether it was in community where we we're talking about gun violence um, and, you know, in youth interrogation and things of that nature. And so that transition, as uh, Mylon already stated, being a young professional, you're not really taken seriously, especially when you're a young person who openly advocates and individuals know your story, right? Like they know your background. They think you're underqualified. They don't take the advice um, that you have seriously and all because I didn't have a law degree. So it made me work it 10 times harder, right? It made me want to bring other young people to Annapolis so that they can see and hear what legislators are talking about who is um, in Annapolis and what is going on, what type of policies are they proposing, how it impacts them within their community, and also show them that you don't have to be a lobbyist in order to impact policy. You can do things within your own community. We all play a role in what policy looks like, the creation, the ideation of it, and also when it's implemented as well. So, you know, I'll stop right there because I know we're going to get into more stuff later on in the conversation, but, you know, I just wanted to mention that. <laughs> Anyone else want to answer? Maya or Ahmad? I want to make sure we get at least the family perspectives and all of these um, as well. So. so I had to type my answer because I'm <laughs> a little all over the place. Um, so my personal experiences, my journey into advocacy and various organizations began with personal experiences, as you all have heard, has deeply impacted my life and my family's life because everything is systemic. It's not just one person that's affected. Um, I recognize the significance of mental health, which a lot of people like to sweep under the rug. Um, I could talk about mental health the, whole, the rest of the time that we're here because I lived it my whole entire life. Story for another day. Um, so mental health and behavioral health issues, as they had a direct impact on me, these experiences fueled my desire to make a difference and advocate for those who often go unheard. My professional background, I have two decades of experience in, <laughs> in the field, <laughs> which have offered valuable insights into challenges and gaps within a mental health system. I saw, I saw firsthand how systemic issues could hinder access to care and support for marginalized communities, communities, including people of color. The professional background became a catalyst for my advocacy work. Networking, I network with anybody. 
I met someone on this side in the airport before. Um, <laughs> building a network within the mental health and advocacy community was instrumental in my journey. I sought out opportunities to connect with like-minded individuals, attend conferences, and participate in workshops to learn more about the latest developments within our field. And then my recommendations for anybody else that's interested in advocacy work um, is to identify your passion, start in the areas that interest you the most, educate yourself. Um, I research every single thing. I always send my son YouTube videos to watch. He's, I'm a, a, the biggest nerd when it comes to things like that. But build a network. Build a network and connect with individuals and organizations that share your goals and values. Attend the conferences, the seminars, and the workshops, and consider joining these professional associations. And then speak up, like Darrell said. Um, don't be afraid to voice your opinions and experiences. Your personal stories can often carry great work. I mean, great weight in advocacy work. Uh, I'll jump in uh, and pick up where Brother Fraser left off. Um, I think. Uh, for me, my advocacy work was, was very much so, um, not to say accidental, right, but I think that as we experience things in life, we, we, it becomes a part of us that we take that upon. Um, some people run from it, right, but some people take it upon themselves as um, a badge of honor or a charge to do more. And so um, myself, like I mentioned, I was system impacted from 14 to about 18. I spent maybe three of those years on and off uh, house arrest. Um, I went to about a dozen schools, yeah, maybe about a dozen schools over a three-year span, so from sixth grade to about tenth grade. Um, I was in and out of schools constantly. Uh, I, I was on house, house rest more than I can remember. Um, I had less than a 1.0 GPA for like two years, um, which I think is always um, really good to mention because um, educationally, right, that's a that's a big pathway for a lot of young people to enter the juvenile justice system, um, whether it's uh, literacy stuff, whether it's um, school teachers or, or uh, security at the at the um, facility or um, schools. I mean, there's so many different ways that education ties into the obviously the the juvenile justice system. So, um, for myself, um, my, when my transformation happened when I was about 16, um, I actually had three warrants or writs out for my arrest and. Um, you know, uh, I went on a retreat led by my mom that I did not want to go, so she made me go. And uh, <laughs> that's, that story is always funny because I went on a, a very um, different Christian retreat. And, and um, in that space, though, it was in a whole different state. And so me leaving the state, I actually got another warrant for my arrest, uh, which is so crazy. But in that space, I found a personal relationship with God, and it was so um, refreshing and, and edifying and transformational. Um, and it's so many details and funny things about that entire story, but I was essentially, I became really a new person overnight. And, um, uh, I just remember, you know, nobody believed it. What I mean, nobody believed it, especially not the judge, of course, <laughs> but nobody believed it. And, um, and, and my grandmother, <laughs> my grandmother and Tate, it was like, mm, you're not smoking no more. You're not drinking no more. You're not, you know, you're not cussing no more. Let's see what happened. And you should be like, 30 days in the juvenile facility. Let's see if that changes anything. So I was in Shellingham immediately after the Christian retreat and um, the most peaceful time of my life. Um, I got out uh, and, and pretty much had a list of things I wanted to do when, um, you know, I wrote a list when I was locked up of things I wanted to do. And, you know, one thing was, you know, uh, uh, join the football team. Another thing was, you know, write for the school newspaper. Um, another thing was, you know, graduate high school. Uh, and, and the last, the fourth thing was live long enough to graduate high school. I, I put that as the fourth thing on there. And um, what I mean, you know, when I came out and, you know, I got a 3-3 GPA uh, the first, you know, well, I, think I, I got a 3-1 the first time and everybody thought I hacked the system. They actually brought me in class. They brought me into the principal's office and asked me how to hack the system. And then I got a 3-5 and they was like, oh, this might actually be something. And then, so, uh, <laughs> and funny enough, um, you know, I had a bet with my security guard. You know, he every A I got, he would give me $15. That only lasts like one quarter. It only lasts like one semester because I started racking up these A's. And so um, I joined the football team. You know, we won a state championship. You know, I joined the newspaper team. Um, you know, I, I ended up um, becoming the editor the next year. And, and so I did so many things. Um, in my community, I graduated high school at 2-1, but I had 3-5 for three years straight just to achieve that. And so the school I went to, my dream school, Morehouse, but um, I didn't, I didn't, you know, they denied me at first, so I had to work extra hard to get into and go to two, two summer school programs just to get in. I didn't have any prospects. Um, and, I, and I think, and I'm telling that story because my 
drive, right, initially it was so hard to get people just to believe in me. It was so hard as I tried to shift and change. It was so hard to get people to be advocates for me. It was so hard to get people to buy in to me buying into myself, um, which was a big thing. And, and I went from being the worst person in the school to literally, if y'all know anything about Green Valley, uh, them trying to, you know, put me in Green Valley and, you know, all those other things. And then the next day I'm getting interviewed by, you know, NBC and <laughs> uh, CNN. And now all these people want to talk to me about how you made a transformational um, turn. And so... Now, being you know an adult, being 27 and working in community intensely, I have a nonprofit where we work with young people, work with young leaders to develop um, meaningful impact uh, and service in community. Um, we've given out almost 80,000 meals to people experiencing homelessness or food insecurity throughout the nation, and so that is um, and have my other roles. I had to then reflect to my roots and say, I'm doing great things in a professional space. I'm doing great things in a nonprofit space. I'm doing things in Atlanta. I'm doing all these great things. I need to figure out a way to give back because I'm still not doing enough. And because of my story now, I'm trying to develop programs for, for high school kids. I'm trying to look into obviously doing more things um, in the juvenile justice space because I'm re just remembering my roots, right? And so um, I'm, a, I'm extremely accomplished, extremely blessed but understanding that, you know, my recommendation for you guys is if you're looking at what to do and how to do it, just do it yourself and, and, and believe in yourself in a way uh, unwavering that only, only you and God can see. And so, you know, God gave you that vision for a reason. And right now I have some things in the juvenile justice system that, that troubles me to my core and that keeps me out, keep me up almost every night. And so um, I, I'm planning to do it myself. And, I, and I'm saying that because um, I want to come to these things. I love coming to these things because I want thought leaders. I want this conversation. I want these ideas. Um, I encourage you guys to look for the same thing. I, you know, it's the difference between having an ally and an accomplice. You guys should look for accomplices. You should look for people who are willing to go as far or farther than you to get the job done. Um, and so that's a totally different thing from allyship. I thank you guys. Um, if I can leave you with any recommendation, if you see an issue in your community, if you see a problem, address it like it's happening in your own house and go after it in a way that you can never um, sleep. So, hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for that. Um, so, I accidentally skipped one question, so I'm going to double up here, just in case you guys are following along your paper. Um, for these are going to be my last two questions before I kick it over um, back to Administrator Ryan as she talks about some recommendations that you all may have for policymakers. Um, but the first question is, how has your experience um, with these various systems inform your positions on relevant justice policy issues? And then talk a little bit about why it's so important to center the voices of um, lived experiences of families and youth um, as it pertains to these um, justice policies. Okay, um, I'll start with this one. For me, um, inadequate support for families. My experience has highlighted the need for better support systems for families navigating through the, just, the juvenile justice system. Families like mine that often struggle to understand the complexities of the legal process. It, it, was, it was a process, that's all I can say. Um, I don't even know how I maneuvered through the process. Um, it's led me to advocate to improve resources and guidance for families dealing with juvenile incarceration. Um, I mentioned to someone earlier that I was really interested in juvenile rehabilitation versus punishment. Um, seeing my child go through the juvenile justice system has reinforced the importance of focusing on rehabilitation versus punishment for young offenders. I've come to realize that many young individuals could be positively influenced and redirected with the right support system and better opportunities. Therefore, I advocate for policies that prioritize rehabilitation and education within our juvenile justice system. Um, I wanted to talk about racial disparities, but I, I'll go over my two minutes. Um, so I'll skip to reentry and support. The challenges that I've seen, not just for my child, but faced upon reentry into society have motivated me to support um, and facilitate successful re reintegration for juvenile offenders. And there does need to be more programs to educate others about job training, independency, support services, and reducing recidivism. 
and I'll let someone else go to work. Um, so I'm going to go from the first question to the second question. Um, so I unfortunately didn't, like, wasn't aware of a lot of the policies that were being in place or, like, the rules until it was already directly affecting my environment. Um, an example being when I was in a qualified residential treatment program for all girls, um, there was an upcoming, like, rule that they were implementing. Uh, it was no reject, eject situation where they can't, like, just they can't just kick out the girls as easily. Um, and so with that upcoming date of that implementation, they started kicking out girls um, or successfully discouraging girls um, as fast and as easy as I will say yes to a Snickers ice cream bar. And it was unfortunate because these girls were um, hurting through the traumas that they endured in this placement. They didn't have anywhere to go to. They didn't have support systems. Um, so again, I, I unfortunately was not aware of a lot of rules and um, policies that were being placed until they were already directly affecting me. Um, the second question was like, what were the gaps of like not, okay. Um, it, for that, that question, it's really the making decisions about me, or wait, no, it's making decisions um, about me without me. Um, so it, it's really that, um, that that piece is really, really sorry i'm losing my track of thought um but for me i personally do not love to get gifts from other individuals um because they always buy me things that they think that i want and need um and however i get the gifts and then they sit there and they're not used and and they're just something that takes up space um so i created a sheet where all my loved ones can see what i want um because so I, I pretty much tell them like if you want to buy me something get it from this list that way 100 percent guaranteed i will utilize the gift 100 percent i will um money will not be down the drain um and 100 percent um that that it's going to meet my needs and my wants and not what you assume that i need and want Um, I wanted to say about being informed on policies or like how did I know about certain policies. I will call Mama Jo, one of my mentors, up real quick if I hear something in a SAG meeting that I don't understand. Um, we created uh, a whole rule um, and it sits on our board where you don't use acronyms. You cannot use acronyms. And if you do use the acronym, you have to break it down. Um, the reason why is because you can DLJ and OJJDP a young person to death and they'll be like, Okay, and what do they do? Um, and so just really making sure that things are comprehensive. And I mean, it's easier that way anyways. Um, but when it comes to like the policies and what we have done or like how being educated on what was going on in my community helped me do legislation, I was seeing a lot of young people, like how Audie had like did that awareness check. And I was like, oh, it's not. Most of the kids in the district are on the box. And I'm like, why are all of us on the box? What's going on? Um, and so we like literally started a whole electronic monitoring campaign through our Youth Leaders in Action Board, um, which carried out for a long time, a year specifically, and it was like one of the best campaigns I was ever a part of because like it was all youth led, and we were in the community really hearing like from the community how they felt. We did focus groups where we brought young people out, um, and we connected with other community-based organizations so we could like have food for our participants and there was a lot of passion around like I'm not an animal. I don't deserve to have a leash on my leg. Like I asked to do cosmetology and now I'm walking around being checked on by a box. I'm, so and I agree with the, the, the gift dynamic, right? You'll come home and say, okay, this is what I want to do and they'll be like, well, you know, most kids they come home and they get their GED and then after you do your GED you go get a trade and it's like you can't really map it out in that way for anybody. And I kind of had learned that basically, and this is how it's going to correlate the policies, is that if you're not reflecting with people closest to the ground, if you're not consulting with people closest to the ground, but then you turn around and you create legislation, like you said, I'm probably not going to ever use that gift because I don't use that type of deodorant or that's not specifically useful to my household. Um, and so I feel like it's an aspect of not only, okay, let's pull things together, let's do focus groups, but actually taking the qualitative and the quantitative, the accurate, Mama Jo say, accurate data, um, because sometimes we have data and it's not accurate. It doesn't reflect um, the people that we're representing and sometimes it's overrepresented, sometimes it's not represented at all. Um, and 
that's really just how I look at it. And also you can just step out there. Uh, our mayors and our town halls, they're all open to the public. A lot of people may not think that because you kind of get this sense of hierarchy when you go out, but um, just recently we got to testify against the DC Safer Stronger Bill. I won't go deep into what my views were because that's not what this space is for, but I had an opportunity as a young person to stand up for my community and speak up for what I felt like was right. And so those are the things that I feel like um, policy-wise that are important. You have to have people um, and it's not even just lived experience, right? Because you're gonna continue to have experiences as you live. It's more so you have to take the people who have been through the nitty and gritty, right? And give them the opportunity to shine and, and be in the room and implement things. Because honestly, I feel like it's a two and two. Like we need the books, we need the people who are understanding and went and got the degrees, but you need the people who have the degrees from the streets too, to be able to tell you culturally speaking, that ain't gonna work, right? So that's, that's my input um, and thank you for the time. I'm gonna make it real quick. I promise. <laughs> I promise it's gonna be real quick. So I'm just, I'm just echoing what you said. Um, so misinnovation. That's what I heard. Um, basically, people that have been through it, walked through it, their insights can inspire creativity to different policy approaches, um, and it can uh, award a more effective. Um, it could be more effective in, achieve, in achieving outcomes for our juveniles. <laughs> Thank you all so much. So with that, um, that's a great segue into Administrator Ryan's question. So I will throw it back over to her. And, and we're tag teaming here. So just jump in, Diamond, if I'm, <laughs> I'm messing up. Um, so I want to shift for a second. Just, um, Darrell, you said something earlier about uh, how some uh, folks might think um, an individual might be unqualified to talk about these kind of issues. And so I want to start with you with, the, with to expand on that a little bit. And the question is, uh, what are some of the frequent misconceptions about uh, involving directly impacted young people and family members in policy discussions or um, conversations like this. So talk to us a little bit more about that answer and, and then we'll open it up to other folks. Absolutely. So um, a lot of times there's a narrative that or just a misconception that individuals who are just as impacted um, they wanted to make this decision, right? That young people, as if young people when they're born, they just say, oh, I wanna go out and I wanna commit this crime. I wanna go rob someone. I wanna go do whatever mistake that it is that they made, right? And that is a misconception, right? Like young people are influenced by the environmental factors, by the environmental circumstances. They are taught um, to, you know, do some of the things that they do, whether it's by accident, we've all been young before, you know, from a brain science perspective, you're really not, your brain doesn't fully develop until you're at the age of 25 years old anyway. So for a lot of us, and then like I said, it's just different factors, but we won't go too far into that. What I think is that, um, you know, when individuals are transitioning back home or after they've been home for a while, people have this, is this connotation that they don't want to be involved, right? A lot of times it's that individuals who are just as impacted don't even know they want to get more involved in policy making and being able to extend their perspective and their views, but they don't know where to start. They don't know where to go. They don't know who are the individuals who I need to be speaking with. Who Some people don't even know who their elected officials are or the even electoral process. And so for me, it was really important that young people was involved in that process. I didn't know as a young person that po what policy or advocacy was. That wasn't a career that I was told that, oh, when you grow up, you can get involved in policy and advocacy. I thought the only way that I could really be get involved within the justice system to make a difference is by becoming an attorney. And there's nothing wrong with that, but there are other avenues that you can take to still be able to impact your community, your family, your peers, et cetera. So for me, what one of the things that I, I do now, and I think that, you know, these are just some practices that, you know, some agencies or organizations or individuals who can be able to take on is to create, develop pipelines to get, get to get justice impacted individuals involved in this work, whether it's through like credible messenger programs, that's for an example, or peer-to-peer -peer advocacy that's providing mentorship, et cetera. One of the things I would say that I don't think is effective, um, and I'll end it with this, is just tokenism. I'm really big on not tokenizing individuals based on their lived experience. Do I believe that young, that young people need to be compensated 
compensated for their time and the work that they're doing, absolutely. Gift cards is not enough. When I say compensated, I mean getting paid for what they're doing. They are experts in their field, whether it's through education, academic, or whether it's through lived experience. I always tell young people, you are an expert. So I think that we have to start to get in that mindset as we incorporate. And I talk a lot, so I'm going to end right there. Uh, Brother Frazier uh, pretty much killed it. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, nah, he did. He did, man. He did. And I, I'm one of them um, the people that hate to hear the. I'm going to piggyback off. He was like, well, I mean, I killed it. You know what I mean? So, um, but no, he, he really did an amazing job. And something he said that, that hit me was um, people, young people being um, ingratiated uh, in, in, in the the system that impacted them, right, uh, on the other side of it. And so I'll speak from my, my personal experience. Uh, I ran from it uh, in a lot of ways. And um, I ran from it because I, I thought for a while I was going to run this race and run it well that I didn't want to walk into a room where people see me as system impacted. I wanted people to walk into a room. Like, if I could walk in pretty much any room and you see a brother in a suit, you know, dressed nice, then I could be anything I want to be. And when we start having that conversation, we're being honest. When you say system impact, when you say foster care, when you say, um, you know, some of the things that you've been through, people start putting in boxes and in labels and in these spaces and places that limit whether it's opportunity that, that um, trickle to certain spaces that um, I was going to recommend you for this job. Now, I don't know if you had financial problems as a kid, if I'm going to, you know, recommend you for a job as a banker. I don't, you know, I just don't know if I'm going to do these things. That's just an example. But I think that for me, as I got older, um, you know, I, I, I believe that, you know, my story was my superpower. And I used to say that, right? And I used to act it out, but I ran from it a lot. And um, I, I'll use a, uh, another example. Um, one of the many blessings I had in high school was that uh, I had a chance to be a part of MBK, My Brother's Keeper, which is President Obama's um, uh, mentoring program that he started in 2014. Uh, along with my, my, my friend Jerron in here. And so um, our mentor, Jerron, a few people will tell you, I, I literally ran from that for about three, four years. Um, didn't talk about it, didn't mention it. Um, it was mentioned, of course, but it was something that I was not comfortable with because of the fact that I wanted when people see me, they see Noah McQueen, and they didn't see the story that came behind it. I, I wanted to make sure that as I ran this race, I ran it so well. I'm here with the Martha Vineyard kids, and I'm here with, you know, the, the Jack and Jill kids. I wanted to be a dope individual academically, professionally in the community that when they see me, they didn't know what I came from or how I came up and stuff like that. So I hid it for an extended period of time because... I didn't want the tokenism. I didn't want the tokenism of, oh, you're only here because of this, or you know, you only got that because of that. And so I don't. I built myself up in this space that I was indestructible, no matter what room I went into. And in that, I forgot who I was in some spaces. And so, um, you know, now, you know, I, I work with a local group called Uspark, trying to, um, you know, assist them in certain ways. Like I said, I'm developing another program uh, for young people. But I think encouraging young people, right, when they are coming on the other side, like, hey, we need to hear your voice. We need to hear your story. We need to hear your success story. We need to hear your struggling story. We need to hear any part of you are, like, you are a valuable asset no matter where you are. I think policy, especially in a place like D.C., can be a big word and a loaded word, right? But I think um, just, just the power and the superpower of your passion, of your, of your experience, um, and some of the things that you went through, even as a young person, uh, I think it really matters, and it has to be on display all the time. And in, in every room you walk into, it has to be with you, especially if you want to do this work. I just want to re-lift up again something that was mentioned is um, the compensation part. I just I really love that because um, for me, this work is very healing, and I know it is for other individuals. So like. Um, being compensated or being paid to do work that is just healing yourself is just so powerful to me. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there and add that comment. You know, our group is pretty awesome. I mean, they, they really come out and say the things that they, they've been thinking about and they put them in words. But unfortunately, there are folks that they cannot put them in the words. And those are the ones that come across with the law enforcement, with any, any agencies, 
they do come across as somebody they don't know what they're talking about and they just push them away. And that is the saddest thing, especially when you come up with a parent who's looking for their kid. That's the only thing I want to say. Thank you. Um, so just to, I, I've heard, I've been taking notes and writing down some of the things that, some of the themes I've heard you say, nothing about us without us. No acronyms, uh, no tokenism, yes to compensation. Um, don't use the, the, you know, tr some of the terminology using the word juvenile or troubled youth, not, not doing that. Um, uh, addressing something like it's happening in your own house. Like these are, these are really rich um, uh, recommendations that you've all put forward. I'd love to just hear you all share a little bit about, okay, expand a little on something maybe you said earlier that was a kind of a something we should do or something we should not do or add to your list. I'd love to just, and just we can popcorn around if anyone, uh, Audi, go ahead. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll start. So something that um, Noah spoke about was that you, you mentioned again was um, acting as if it was in your own home. Um, I did this activity in a project, um, I mean, in a meeting one time and it, it just really hit home and it was just a simple activity that just like, it, it was just great um, and powerful. Um, so the, the activity was like you essentially just fill out some blanks, blank spaces, um, and it said my child. So it was about your child. So it said my, um, I want my child to feel this, um, or I want my child to experience this. Um, and it just went on and on and on. And folks shared their responses and it all sounded very similar. Like I want my child to feel loved. I want my child to experience happiness, joy, um, and so forth. And again, a lot of the answers were similar. Um, and then the people working the activity um, gave us a new lens to look through. And it said, um, by any chance, did any of your papers say, I want my child to feel lonely. I want my child to feel unsafe. Um, I want my child to, ex or I want my child to experience the juvenile justice system, the foster care system. Um, and as simple as it sounds, it just, it really hit home for me um, because now that I am a mother, um, I just could not imagine that even though I'm doing great work in the world, um, I just cannot imagine my daughter making a mistake and being put into the system. I would lose my mind. Um, and so it, it was, it's just a re-reminding me that I have to continue to look through that lens that this is somebody's child um, this person is loved and somebody longs for this person or their young individual to be loved like you would want to treat your own child. So. I, I have a, uh, another recommendation or something that you know people could do. Uh, I encourage, does anybody here have come from a STEM background? Can you raise your hand? You have a STEM background? STEM, ST, ST, science, technology, engineering. I'm sorry. I, I, you just said something. Yeah. You also said the box earlier, and I want to explain to people what the box of electronic and modern. Uh, but no, STEM background. And so, I, and, and I'm saying this because um, I, and this even goes to the last question about being qualified in certain spaces. I just finished a six month uh, rotation at Microsoft, and I have no type of techni like no type of technological experience or trade whatsoever. And I'm saying that to say, in about 10 years, 10 to 12 years, there'll be 670,000 jobs in STEM um, in the United States of America. And so I brought this up, you know, when we were in Tacoma, and, and I will keep bringing it up because, uh, you know, as I'm looking at the landscape um, and some of the things that's really important is, is economic justice uh, and economic resilience. And that's where we're preparing the next generation. At the very least, we have to prepare them and, be, and explain to them, hey, I understand you like, you know, being an entrepreneur. Have you thought about shifting your business model to, um, you know, something that's into digital marketing? You know, or if you like to draw, what does graphic design look like for you in a, in a um, technological stance, uh, standpoint? Um, how does that look at EA Sports? I know we got people that love the game. How do you see yourself in gaming and technology and the illustration of it, the storytelling of it? All these things matter. E-gaming and they do have colleges, universities that have it as a major now. Promoting that and not just telling your kid to get off the game. I think it matters in a sense of preparing our generation for the next space because um, you know, we can't hold these spaces and these places and these positions forever. 
And as we're developing young people and young leaders, that should be our primary focus and de develop them for the next generation so that they're not scared of what comes, um, so they're not nervous or they're not underprepared, but that it's, it's equitable, it's safe, um, it's, it's proper training. And these are things we can do today because YouTube University has always been free until they, <laughs> until they make it unfree. But also there are people um, that there are substantial resources today that promote these things. And we have some, I have a six year old sister who stays on the iPad all day. And, and just knowing that, right, what it looks like in 10, 15 years in the workforce and what it looks like her developing those skills. Now, how are we curtailing that from just playing Roblox to making sure that you get some math, uh, math skills in there, to make sure you get some coding skills in there, to make sure that you feel comfortable and confident when you interface with technology that is not a, um, an enemy, but a tool and something that you're comfortable with. And that, that goes for everybody up here um, as well. How are we doing that to prepare the next generation to create economic justice, to create economic resilience, to um, when AI, people start having conversations about AI, you, your ears perk up, you go to the event instead of saying, I don't know nothing about that. And so, and making it equitable across all generations, not just um, young people, but making sure that we are, just how we come to these events, we go to the AI events, we go to technological events and learn because that learning piece, even if we don't get it or we don't use it, we're then able to talk about it and use it. And like I said, I work for an HBCU tech company called Propel. I am not a techie but I'm in the spaces where they have these conversations and it's under Apple. So I have, I understand the, the shift that's about to come. And my biggest thing right now is preparing, even though I, I do not know how to use a lot of things, but I can talk about it with people that have the capacity, have the skill set, and have the audience to teach others. And so I think that's the most important thing, talking about that, that next revolution, um, the technological revolution, and make sure that we are a part of it. And, and if we want to impact it, we have to first see ourselves in it. And we have to see ourselves in it means we have to enter it and enter it fearlessly uh, just as like we enter these rooms. Um, I really love that point, and I would love to take you back. <laughs> I'm laughing at what you said earlier. Um, and I feel like you hit more on like the education and why it's needed, but also there's a safety aspect to it too. Um, last week, Restore and Ivy Collective had an opportunity to take clients on the hill to push the Kid Online Safety Act, and it taught me so much about the harms of online as well. And so if we don't have the education, we can't have the prevention. Um, a lot of young ladies and young men are exploited through online. They get in access to disparities online as well. We're in a new era, so understanding how communications and, and how healing looks is a little bit different than it may have been back then, but also still promote people to use pen and paper. <laughs> Literally, I do that in my classes all the time. Like, we do affirmations on paper, because, you know, that's the only way you can really manifest those blessings that God has for you. Um, I did want to say that um, lately when, what was it, we were at the task force communicating with their uh, President Biden's task force, and they were talking about implementing new peer models. And I was like, oh, wait, why? I had like, stop it. I'm like, we have so much peer work going on right here in D.C. Um, and I try to take every conference or every opportunity to really speak on like what's going on in D.C. and what we're doing because sometimes it's unseen and it's so important to people who are doing the work such as Trigger Project D.C., Peace for D.C., like they're literally out in the community teaching young people about gun violence, teaching them how to combat gun violence, how to be brand ambassadors. I've literally rode around with Mama Joe all day one day. We went to an Alliance of Concerned Men uh, a meeting. And they were literally debating about how they were about to house a mom whose son had just went through gun violence. And the thing is, when we get into these conversations about how to help people, it becomes politics. It's not human. So you stop thinking about, oh, dang, well, they don't have anywhere to lay their head at to, oh, well, this number says this, and that number says this. And it's just like uh, we, like, like you said earlier, humanize not only the testimonies, but when you see those numbers, those are humans too, right? And they literally have sacrifices and losses that they have been through, and the last thing they want is to go through a traumatic situation. I'm not even going to go all the way back to that story because I was just like, oh, my God, I could never imagine that. And in the midst of that, all they're doing is being like robots, like, oh, you're looking for your people? Oh, we don't know. That's not right. Nobody deserves to go through inhumane processes while learning how to be a human or learning how to embrace humanity. A lot of us don't come from those households where we get hugs and, 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 and et cetera. So for you to assume as soon as I walk through the door that I'm going to know this and I'm going to know that, and I'm actually not culturally competent in a lot of those areas, 
serious. That's how it was for me because I had manners. They used to be like, oh, she don't need no help. She's good. She knows how to talk. Low key, I'm struggling with mental health, depression. My mom was locked up. I had one of my mentors tell me uh, not too long ago, she was like, your mom's been locked up this whole time? I'm like, we've known each other for five years. <laughs> and it's not no shade to her, but just like understanding how deep you go into it, understanding that with policies, yes, it's legislation, and you can get into the red and the blue, but it's really just a human's life. And like like she said, would you want your kid to go through the same experience? And most of the times you have to do that, and that's sad, because we don't really care until it hits our threshold. Um, but gun violence has been one of the biggest things that have been impacting our lives in the city lately and, and just really trying to understand the propaganda around young people. We are not violent. We are not dangerous. We are not delinquents. We are not juveniles. Those things, when you say it, it's actually like harmful, it's like calling a black person a threat, right? Because at the end of the day, we're the future. So if we're the future and we're the next STEM kids and all that. Why online and on the news are we being portrayed as gangsters? And, and literally, to be real, the politics, the people, people doing politics be the gangsters for real, for real, just saying, and not to throw, just being honest. And so I just feel like it's a, a call to action to be human. Like, if, if anything else, when you leave the room, understanding that these, these are humans, people on the board are humans, we're not objects, we're not people that, oh, you can come and put this little paper together for me, make an MOU. Like, um, when I say that, meaning that there's a lot of organizations who don't get to gain funding or gain access to these rooms because they're not known of and because they're not willing to scrape on the wall and cry for it, they'll do it on their own. I know a lot of people that pull out of their pockets to do the work that we do. Um, even me, when I go out and I do the violence interruption work that I'm doing with the, sex, the sexual exploitation, the anti-trafficking space, I'm always like, oh, let me go to Dollar Tree, spend ten dollars here. Like, and the thing is, that's because we do it from our heart. So imagine if the policies were being brought from the heart as well. That's all I had to say. Real quick, I promise. I'm just paraphrasing. <laughs> so what I hear is people. In position should make assumptions. Don't make assumptions about the survivors, and each one of us here are survivors in our own right, but each one of our situations are unique to us. So you need to individualize how to help people instead of making it so broad. That's right. That's Thank you. Thank you for paraphrasing that spirit and lifting that up. That's really great. Um, I'd love to hear just sort of piggybacking on everything that, that you all have said, um, because each of you uh, has done a tremendous amount of work advancing policy, advancing policy reforms or practice reforms. I mean, Ahmad, you, you mentioned that you've been involved with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, one of our grantees uh, for many, many years, and, and maybe I've asked you to kick this discussion off. You just tell us a little bit about your work with them and with Team Hope. Um, ha have you, have you, um, do you have any examples of how uh, there might be changes that have been impacted by the work that you've done, either through Team Hope or NICMIC or one of the other uh, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children? I'm, not, I'm trying not to use acronyms here. It's my land's I'm going to push the beep button if I do that. Um, so, yes. Uh, if you want to talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. Yes, NECMAC, N-E-M-E-C. <laughs> uh, I've been involved with uh, National Center since I think it was 30-something years, and I got involved with uh, um, the, the Team Hope when it started with Abby Potash when her kid was missing. And, um, and I have to tell you, probably for the most part I hear everybody saying, what they've experienced through talking to others and seeing others or experiencing others. I have too. I've seen so many parents that they're just chasing, have no idea where they go. And Team Hope is me and a whole bunch of parents who've gone through it and they can tell them, hey, listen, instead of running around with the police officers or your, your uh, person that you're involved in in the police department, these are the things you should do and help yourself. And when you give that information to somebody, you'd be surprised. You become the folks who are sitting here. They know what they want. They have experienced it. They know it. They've seen it many times. And I do the same thing. I, most of my clients in Team Hope 
most of them work for NECMAC. Now, uh, back then when I met them on the phone, they probably were trying to kill themselves, some of them, unfortunately. Some of them had no idea where their kid was. Some of them, they found their kids in pieces, and they are disasters. But when you give them that information that, hey, this is the path that you have to take, because there are so many people take that path. Um, it is, it's amazing. It, it's amazing that what you make or help a parent survive themselves and if they have other kids to, to help them grow. So uh, Team Hope has been the most amazing thing for me, but uh, NECMEC has really come a long way. I, I'm sure you know about it too. They are really a strong company, I mean, organization now, and they are constantly advancing in the today's days because me and Noah probably have very little in common in what we do, and he doesn't do well with technology, and I don't either. <laughs> but, but we do have the same idea about what to do with our world. And, and kids are maybe a third of our population, but 100% of our future. I have six kids, and I tell them, hey kids, I changed your diaper, you better change mine. <laughs> Uh, my, and, and my, my question for you is, because I think you're a great person to speak on this, how do you feel about the, the Ebony Alert, um, whether it's some, some positive or negatives, and those not familiar with the Ebony Alert, I believe it's a, the, basically an Amber Alert for black people, uh, and, and I, I think it's instituted in California, and so, um, I, and this can be for anybody, but I would love to ask you because of your, your institutional knowledge and um, your background, what, are, what do you perceive to be the positive and negatives of something like an Ebony Alert um, in this day and age? I have to tell you, it's, it's amazing that we have started it, right? This is really a good thing. But in our society, we do deal with racism since the beginning of time. And unfortunately, I don't think anybody wants to deal with it. Nobody wants to address it. Nobody wants to face it. And when you tell them, oh my God, you think they think you're like some from uh, Mars or somewhere. <laughs> and and when you when you ask him, and I have to tell you, I asked the judge in Florida that that what did he see in me? He says he was, uh, and I'm sad to say that he says he was in the army and he ran into some tribal people that had no idea about American laws. And I told him, I said, listen. I had a bachelor when I arrived in this country, and I had got my MBA, and I do understand American laws. I've never broken them. I've, yes, I may be speeding, but, but actuality, just like everybody else, I haven't done anything. Why would you assume that because I have an accent and my name is Ahmad Riviswar, what would you think that I, I don't have any idea about American laws? That is the concept, unfortunately, in many people in this country. And as much as we try, and I know these folks are strong enough to do it, and I have tried in my life, I tell my kids, I have six kids, and I tell them if they will stand by someone making a comment about them, even though their mom was American, they were born here, and their dad has been American for 46 years, but you cannot just stop. We have to advance. I mean, I am so proud of this group because they're standing on their own and they're speaking out. But that, unfortunately, is not going to work, unfortunately, because we don't care about others. Not as much as we should. Not as much as when I came here in 1976, this was America, it was amazing. My dad used to tell me, go learn American ingenuity. Don't learn how to make this stuff. Learn how to live. And I have a try. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add an example? I know Jarrell, you and Audi. Yeah. Audi, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I don't want to brag, but I do chair a council in Iowa, the Youth Justice Council. And uh, what that is, is essentially it's um, youth-led, youth advocates 
um, all system impacted, and essentially what it is, I'm so sorry, my brother's clawing me, he's actually in basics, so that's kind of crazy. Um, he, um, sorry, that completely threw me off. Um, but we're young individuals who essentially set goals for ourselves. Um, we identify problems and, and we say like, we're gonna work towards fixing this. Um, and through that, so much has been accomplished in the, the short amount of time that we have existed. Um, and I hear so many individuals say that so many times, they, they relift that. Um, I, I know a really um, powerful individual in Iowa, he said like, you know, I was dragging through this work like, um, I started to lose my motivation and then I came and I worked with the Youth Justice Council and for some reason I feel life again. I feel, I remember the reason why I, I, I am in this line of work. Um, and, and that made me feel good um, to, to hear that. Um, but to, for them, they are saying that we're doing really great things. And to me, it's also crazy because it's like, why haven't these things be, been done? Um, so it did confuse me on that part, but we've done some really great things. We have individuals who are still currently in the system and individuals who have been in the system. Um, so through that, we're able to get um, really good voice from everyone. Um, and one thing that we're, that I was doing right now is um, the state training schools were having, um, individuals were having to pay for their phone calls to talk to loved ones. Um, and when higher up individuals heard that, they were like, what, why is that happening? Um, and yet it was happening for so long. Um, so now they're changing that and, and young individuals do not have to do that anymore. Um, another thing is we've made several recommendations to our juvenile justice task force. Um, and, and a lot of those recommendations were taken on by such a higher group. Um, We've done um, code changes, um, uh, recommendations for like detention centers and, and so forth, but we've done a lot of great work in, again, a short amount of time um, when other individuals have worked for, for tens of years um, and, and just haven't taken the initiative to do something themselves. So I think that's a really great positive of having um, youth um, lead. All right, everyone, I know it's a little cold in here and the, the, the room getting a little quiet, so just want to tell you all, you know, shake it off a little bit, you know, stand up if you have to. But um, just so, so I'm, I'll be very quick, but want to touch on the question that Administrator, Administrator Ryan um, proposed. So first, I just want to say that I know earlier I mentioned about compensating our youth. Yes, we want our youth to be compensated, but equity is more than just compensating them as well. I also want to make sure that I add on that you have to provide them with opportunities, resources, things of that nature. And so one of the opportunities that I was fortunate to be a part of was y, YGLI. So so YGLI is the Youth Justice Leadership Institute that is implemented by the National Juvenile Justice Network. And so prior to me applying and being a part of this amazing like leadership development cohort, I was already doing policy, community engagement, doing all these things in the community to really impact just like the trajectory of so many young people's lives. But what I also wanted to do was to expand my own skill set. I feel like I'm a life learner. I'm, I want to always be able to just learn and educate myself and be able to expand my impact. And so through the the Leadership Institute, I was really able to be effective in just some of the policies that we were doing within the state of Maryland. For an example, um, I will just share with you all our youth, inter our youth interrogation bill. So in the state of Maryland, we had um, a, a situations that were arising amongst young people where law enforcement was interrogating, questioning young people without an adult, a mentor, some type of supervised guardian or someone that was present. We all know that sometimes young people can be impressionable. You use big words. They may not understand. They may say, yeah, this whole time, they really don't even understand what you're talking about. Earlier, <laughs> Marlon mentioned about, uh, about, um, no, uh, Oh, acronyms. acronyms, yeah, sorry, I forgot the word. About acronyms, and so that's used often, especially when you're use, utilizing legal terminology. And so it was important for us that we've seen, that this, we've seen this as an issue because a lot of young people were admitting to doing crimes that they really never even committed, but out of fear, they said yes to because with, if they didn't say yes, they felt like they were going to be penalized, et cetera. And so it took us two years to be able to pass this uh, youth interrogation bill, but we finally had it passed. Ms. Melissa Goldsman, who's also a part of NGGN, it's a part of our uh, juvenile justice 
No, you're fine. The Maryland Juvenile Justice Coalition. So that's just one example that I wanted to mention um, just on how we were able to, one, include young people. We, de we definitely did like a, a listening tour throughout the entire state of Maryland, um, do a, a committee of individuals who are impacted juvenile justice work. And then we also engaged different stakeholders as well. We wanted to listen to them, listen to their concerns, their ideas, et cetera. So I think that it's just so important. And so as you all are, you know, thinking about policy, whether it, while it's in the idea phase, don't develop it and then go to the community and present it to them for feedback. Just, and even in the idea phase, when you are thinking about it, include community, include those individuals as well. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, so I want to ask one more question, then I want to give the audience an opportunity to comment and ask questions. Um, so, we, so for the panelists in the room here, we have um, uh, staff from and leadership from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, from the National Institute of Justice, from the Bureau of Justice Assistance, Bureau of Justice Assist, uh, Statistics, the SMART Office, the Office of the Assistant Attorney General, as well as training and technical assistance providers who do a lot of our work um, on the ground supporting grantees around the country. And so the individuals in this room are in leadership positions across uh, the Department of Justice as well as other agencies. Uh, and um, if their agency hasn't done this kind of thing, right, how would they get started? Like what, what are the two or three things you might recommend like if they were going to move into a space where they were really having directly impacted people uh, in their uh, in their work, what would be the several things you would recommend to get started? And Audi, you look like you're about to. Oh, no, Ahmad, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Ahmad. I, I was going to say, you know, you're videotaping this, right? And I think it would be a good idea for them to listen to everybody speaking. I think most organizations should. I mean, we are we are a country that's changing, and hopefully changing for better. And we need to get everybody in this panel everywhere. I really do. I enjoy even listening to them because I, I hear a lot of great ideas and it's got examples, samples, and they have their own experiences in it. It's pretty awesome. So why, why shouldn't they, they do it? Why shouldn't they take your videos and off they go? It would be pretty easy for them to start. Great idea, thank you. Yes, my, uh, wait, my, I think I had Audi and then my land. Yeah. Um, I would say, I know it kind of incorporates to one of the questions that was asked earlier, but it's really just creating space um, for those individuals, like a safe space. Um, and, and another thing is authentically engaging these people. And one of those authentic engagement factors is um, not collecting individuals who already agree with you. Um, because then you're doing it wrong. Um, it's okay to have individuals who have different opinions, um, different needs and wants, because we all do. Like I probably use a different lotion or shampoo that, than all these other individuals do. Um, so that, that would be my two things, creating a safe space um, for them to do that. Oh, and compensation. Let me say that again, compensation. <laughs> And I'm sorry I was about to cut you off earlier because I really love all the insight that you share. Every panel we do, I'm like, yes, because um, we be the youngest ones, well, some of them. Uh, but I really feel like there's also a need for maybe implementation of like, you know how you guys do a lot of trainings and you come out and you teach people, you guys are the experts, maybe changing it around where you're put in a position where you're uncomfortable and you have to learn and be challenged by what we bring to the table. Not even just me or us, but like just in general, the information. Because it's one thing when you've reached that level and you're like, I know everything. <laughs> I've been working in this space for almost 20 years, honey. You're not going to tell me anything about a policy, anything about a SAG. But the thing is, we actually could. Um, and so maybe turning it around where the trainings are being done by uh, what we look at as leadership or changing how you look at leadership because the young people should be leading the way if you're going to be passing the baton over to us. We're going to make mistakes. We don't know everything. We haven't been doing it for 20 years, but we do know what works and what doesn't work. Um, and so maybe some type of training realm, I don't know, I don't want to throw organizations out there or anything like that, but connecting like with Youth Move or something like that, but doing a series where it's actually for the policy makers and the legislators. Because like we do so many trainings on how to show up, how to speak to you all, how to present, how to shake a hand. 
But I've only seen a lot of trainings on how to engage with a young person, how to build a young person up, how to add a young person to the policy board. Most of our boards that we see now with the directors, you don't see any young people on those boards. It's people who've like served for 20 years and like, yeah, she's deserved her right to be on the racial equities. It's like, okay, great. But where's the person who's going to bring that euphemism and that life to the board? Because also, I'm not going to lie, when you guys have been in these spaces for a little while, you get a little, little antsy or angry. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, she needs some coffee. Um, but we're hyped up still. We got a lot of energy. So it's like utilize it where we're learning from you, but also you're gaining something from us too. Yeah, uh, I I'm a big proponent of cross-collaboration. And so um, there's a few things I would just say. One, um, being okay with the differences of others, because that's what makes us grow uh, and move forward. We cannot make sustainable and meaningful change if everybody in the room looks like us, sound like us, talk like us, think like us. Um, that is that is how you have some of the issues in other systems where it's like, okay, this is diversity quota, but they come from the same socioeconomic background, so how really how much different is this situation? Um, I heard uh, earlier about policy and I heard about politics. Your policy or your politics is not more important than your people. And so that should be always the number one thing uh, when it comes to partnering um, and it comes to making decisions. I also wrote it down in here. Uh, I think you mentioned earlier making decisions about me without me. Uh, these are all, I mean, I've been writing over here and these are all meaningful things because as we go out into our spaces, we have to be very conscientious that we are at this C-suite high level um, in a lot of rooms and we're making a lot of decisions. Uh, I think primarily just my role in some of the spaces that I, 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 I sit is just to level set. It is literally just to have a hu like a human, a heart in the room, just to have some type of humanity to think about, okay, you have a beach house, you have a yacht, you have <laughs> all, you have an amazing stock portfolio, but you're trying to relate to a single mother of three with two jobs and going to school, and you're trying to make decisions as if you were her. Let's 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 be honest. Let's be real. You you know I don't think you know anybody personally that's been her, and so and even if you have, that is still not her. Um, and so I I think uh, in all the ways we are fearless, and all the ways that we wake up in the morning and and answer the call, answer the charge, whatever that may be in our work, I think we have to always check our biases at the door. Um, as well as our own preconceived notions of what that personal situation looks like, because it may call for you to tap into a part of your spirit or your humanity that you've never had to before, just to enter and respond to a conversation with a person who was in crisis mode. It may not even be to fix it, but it may just to be there and to listen and to provide support when and how you can, because some situations, who being honest, there are some situations that no matter how much support we lend, it is still won't be enough. Um, no matter how much love and resources we give, it just may not be enough. Some, a lot of the situations are fractured or fragmented to the point that it's just, you, you can't replace a child, you can't replace loss, you can't replace um, some of these things, but we wake up every morning and try to do the work anyway. And so you have to realize coming into these rooms, leave your biases at the door, um, emphasize cross-collaboration, emphasize reaching down into that vulnerability or that space that led you into the work, but also understand that you may not have the answer to that question. That's also okay. But that's why you look at those partnerships and reach out and have that humanity with the people in the room because um, it, it's a lot of weight to, to bear and we none of us should be bearing that alone. I'm going to be real quick, I promise. Um, so uh, one of the things that I was going to mention uh, as I listened to everyone talk about um, the different, you know, perspectives, et cetera, is that, uh, you know, a lot of times these decisions, well, first I would just say, just to start us off, you know, just, just do it. 
even if it's not all the way thought out, even if it's not perfect, you know, your idea on how to incorporate, you know, young people, the first phase of it is just getting started. Um, I think really pushing, you know, for the for, for this to happen, it, it can be very challenging sometimes, especially in like the government settings, especially when you're dealing with politics, et cetera. So you have to get sometimes very creative and innovative around what that looks like. And sometimes you may can't do it in your internal department at all. You may have to collaborate or partner with a, a non profit agency um, or organization or someone that can really help you bring it to, to life because you have to have buy-in from leadership and that's one of the things I wanted to mention. Like if it's not foundational within your department that did, from leadership that this is a priority and this is something that you want to address, then it, you can really have a negative impact on re-traumatizing the young people or the family members or, you know, those who are indirectly or directly impacted, um, you know, in an unintentional way. I always tell people impact over intent. You can have great intentions on, you know, trying to create solutions and, you know, be positive and, you know, help young people, et cetera, but your impact, um, it doesn't resonate that way with them um, because, like I mentioned before, you can really uh, re-traumatize. So that's just um, what I quickly wanted to mention. Maya, you can go ahead. It's going to be real quick. <laughs> Everybody said everything. But um, cultural competency. I think that everybody really needs to know what that is <laughs> when working with families, when working with survivors, when working with our juveniles, um, and having a, a better understanding of how to verbalize things to people without being offensive, um, honestly. And then also authentic advocacy. <laughs> What's your why? Like, why are, you, why are you advocating for others? Are you doing it because your job says so? Are you, are you doing it so that you could be uh, brought up and somebody could glorify that you're advocating for juveniles? Like, what is your why? I think that's important. All of us up here have a why. We all identify what our why is, and I think that as professionals, they need to identify what theirs is as well um, because that's important. We're not just a number. Our families aren't just a number. And um, I think that it would be important, like, if more uh, what am I supposed to use? Yeah, more, <laughs> sorry. More young people were heard um, in the impacts of their stories um, life after. All of y'all are great. I, I learned something every time. I done adopted Milan. Yes. I adopted her. But um, yeah, just getting to know the why of those that were affected is important. So we have a few more minutes. I want to open it up to anyone in the audience if you want to provide a brief comment to our panelists. Um, any reaction? Yes, please. and if you wouldn't mind, there's a microphone right over there. Um, if you wouldn't mind walking up to the mic, thank you. I appreciate that. Or we can pass it around. We're coming over to you with the mic. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Cheryl Crawford. I'm from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And um, I'm just like so pleased to be here today. I was not the designated person to come. I was the, with someone else and they weren't able, then I volunteered to come. I, my area that I service um, is for youth, young adults. Um, and on my team um, that I work with my colleagues, we also have um, criminal justice funding. And so um, this is just so appropriate. First, I want to applaud you guys, every last one of you, okay? What you didn't mention and what was a takeaway for me is that while you're here today, why you was able to thrive and be resilient is because you kept showing up. Okay, you kept showing up, you saw opportunity, and you just kept showing up, okay? So that's one, so I wanna commend you for the despite, despite, okay? Um, what you have gone through and what was so insurmountable, okay? So um, my role there at SAMS is that um, I've, um, I'm a part of a team that arranged for funding to communities to work with youth and their families to improve, to engage them in treatment, substance use treatment, and also for those who are re-entering the community from the criminal justice system, 
okay? So we provide funding to community agencies. They apply for it. What I would like to know, because we do provide incentives, okay? Um, there are incentives when we're trying to get youth to come into treatment. We do. We want them to come. We can't pay people to come into treatment, but we certainly can help them. We try to remove the barriers such as transportation, clothing, um, housing. We try to meet those needs. But what I would like to know specifically, and I think um, Ms. Barnes mentioned it, she mentioned about incentive, okay? Tell me a little bit more. What would be an incentive for a young person who's in need of treatment? And we want to provide it, but to get them to say yes. So, um, and then when I say incentive, I really want to correct that because I feel like you hear like a little gift card or and a, and a such, and it's, it's more than just the contingency case management that's being implemented. Um, you have to do the relationship building. Mm -hmm. Like you can you can have everything a young person yep. wants. I swear I'm not speaking directly from me. Mm -hmm. And still it was like, dang, but she didn't even check on me today. She didn't even ask me how I felt. They don't know what's going on at home. And I'm not saying that that's not going on, but it's a balance of creating those relationships and also understanding that so it's a process. Everybody, you know, the pre-contemplation, contemplation, the stages, some of us are still contemplating. And so that trust in that building or going out on those items and using that incentive to buy me some subway while we sit down and talk, it's more so how you use the incentive versus, you know, what it is, I feel like. And I mean, it does matter what it is too. Of course, don't get a $5 at Walmart gift card and think they're going to be like, oh yeah, cool, great, we're going to do so something. So am I hearing therapeutic relationship building? Yes, yes. And it's taking the interest. Okay, yes, therapeutic yes, relationship building. Yes, I get yes, that. I yes. get that. I get that. Yes. Uh, I was just going to say, I mentioned this when we was in uh, Tacoma last time um, uh, in the summer, one of the incentives of things, the takeaways, I was, I was kind of taught and trained that when you're able to assemble a group of people, make sure they leave with something that they need, um, whatever that is. And so mm -hmm. if, if, if in the way that you do your programming, right, if there is an assembly of some sort, if there's a conference, if there is some type of situation, the identifying what their primary day-to-day -day needs or issues are and addressing those matter. And I, I brought up in a conversation, you know, we had all those people in Tacoma, I was saying, how much more powerful would it be if for the locals that there was people, um, there was court, uh, organizations, corporations that were doing on-site hiring today, they would leave with a job. Or if they already, if they didn't have one, they have one. If they had one, they leave with two. Um, how much more impactful would that be if you had uh, and, I, and I've been a part of experience where you literally came into a room, you, you had a haircut, they gave you a suit, they, gave, they looked at your resume, they put you through a mock interview, and the last station was a job interview. And, like, and, and I'm not saying, I know budget-wise and everything, you know, that's, but I always say create the idea and the vision, let other people work, you know, feel like once you have it, the funders will come. Um, sometimes it's easier said than done. But, and, and I also mentioned like, hey, if people have a digital divide, a technological divide, Partnering with organizations that give those things freely, um, you know, matters. Uh, college admissions, if people are considering school, trade admissions, if people are considering trade, having all that in one place and space to say, hey, you know, pretty much explaining to those organizations, this is our group, these are our people, we're going to, you know, we're going to gently work with them and make sure that they have the resources that they need, but we need you to make sure you find a space and place for them. And that assemblance of talent with need and a great, like you literally can leave that place with the entire different outcome and chance in life. And I would just say, um, depending on your program and if you're doing a similar and stuff, amazing incentive. If I can go somewhere and get a job, uh, a laptop, an iPad, a chance to go to school, um, a trade, if I, I would go to that conference every day of the week. Um, and I'm, that's just one of the examples I think as far as incentives. No, I, I like your response and it um, pretty much um, validates um, what we encourage um, at our level is that when our community organizations are out there, boots on the ground, meeting with you, you show up showing them that you have the resources that they need at that time. And if you have what they need, then yeah, they'll say yes. That's, that was, that's how we, um, our perspective. But now I will also want to ask, I think, um, Ms. Halsey, did I pronounce it incorrectly? I heard you say about support, re-entry support. And I would like for you to tell me a little bit more what would support look like? Because I'm taking this back to the office. They expect me to come back <laughs> with a less. Okay. Real quick. 
mm-hmm, to say. Mm-hmm. I just did that for them. Um, but no, honestly, um, support will look like follow through. Like some some individuals told my son, that, "Well, we're going to help you with your resume. We're going to help you get a job. We're going to help you know what independence living looks like. We got you." Where are they at? <laughs> Where nobody has been consistent. So he has a lack of buy-in. He's not bought in with any services that will come to him right now and tell him that they will help him. It took for me, like I said earlier, I was his natural support. I'm his only. I, and the people that were standing, I had an army behind me. They weren't family. That helped me, right? This lady said, Maryland Corps has a program. She sent him the application. He's actually at College Park right now going through that process. He wasn't going to go. At the, at the last second, he was like, forget it, because the transportation was a barrier. We live two and a half hours away. <laughs> so yesterday I had to get my goddaughter, had to meet him at the bridge. I had to come up to the bridge yesterday, drop him off. She met, met us at the bridge to make sure that he was in place. So... But if, but if he didn't have, if he didn't have that family member, someone to assist him, transportation would have been a barrier. Am I correct? Am I correct? Because that's two hours away is a distance. It is a distance. Okay. Yeah. So. All right. So that's a barrier. So that is something that um, we need to look at, you know, on our end, that we need to look into in, in terms of when we write our funding opportunity announcement, organizations are going to pro- provide um, support to those who's reentering into society again, that they also help um, with connecting them with the resources that they have, transportation, that they take into consideration where the person lives. Because we know that, you know, we, we don't always have a car, bus, um, metro card or something. Resources are limited. So we are, if we're helping, if we're a community organization that we are supposed to be helping, then we should have the resource to connect them, to do that warm handoff. That's what I believe that I think I'm hearing that you did that your son didn't have yeah a lot of people aren't familiar with the demographics of Maryland they think that everywhere in Maryland is Baltimore and PG County and that's not true so Mm -hmm. they think that they're doing a warm handoff when they're doing an injustice right so okay may I also add something um another Um, barrier that I've been able to identify with several individuals is that there's a lot of resources and supports, um, but they make it nearly impossible to receive those supports. Um, I remember being, like just an example, I remember being in a building where it had like different kinds of services and I overheard a conversation where um, a family um, wasn't able to receive, I think it was like food stamps because they made one dollar more, but yet that one dollar more was not enough to feed their whole family. Um, So again, just um, relifting that up and then another individual I remember saying, um, asking him like, um, do you not have any resources for these, for your youth that you work with? And he's like, yeah, I have this big binder. It's like required for me to have. And it has like 100 pages, but only three pages actually work. Like service, it's not updated. Services are out and they just don't tell us. Um, And again, just that barrier of having too many requirements to, to get help. Good afternoon, panel and friends. I'm Noah's grandmother. Hi, Noah. (laughs) Noah invited my husband and I, and this is the first time we've really been somewhere together, so I'm so excited about that. I'm sitting here listening to everything that you all are saying. I heard the lady back there mention the word medication. I agree with you when it comes to medication because medication don't solve all your issues. As a matter of fact, it makes it worse sometimes. You're correcting one thing and it's causing other problems. So just pay attention to your medications and what you're taking. I work in behavioral health also like you do. So I know where you're coming from. And half of the time, the patients don't even want to take medication. I remember when Noah was growing up, his other sister said to the mother, You could get a check for him because something is wrong with that boy. And and, and it was. Nothing really was wrong with him. He was just a typical boy. Boys are bad, straight up. I mean, it is is what it is. If you have boys and girls, you see, 
No offense, brother. If you have boys and girls, you see a big difference. Girls, as they used to tell us growing up, girls are fresh and boys are bad. That's what they used to tell us growing up. So as you raise them, you're looking at all the little things they're getting into, like God bless me to have a great grandson. His mother's like, he is something else, and I have to keep saying he's a boy. He's just a boy, and that's what boys do. So um, I want to thank God for Noah because I never thought that I would walk my feet in the White House. I never dreamt of that, and I always wanted to go in the White House all the time. I mean, I used to want to um, let my kids go on the lawn for the East Egg Roll and all that, but you have to go through so many changes, security clearance and this and that. You're like, it ain't worth it. I ain't doing that. And then when Noah came along and I walked and got in that line and walked in the White House, I mean, I had like a hinge on my neck. I couldn't even keep my neck straight because I was so excited. I couldn't even believe that I had a child. Well, he, he is my child. I can't believe that I had a child that walked with former President Obama. I was excited. I mean, we, I'm from New York, so we went all over New York like a wildflower. No, it's with the president. You know, everybody was excited and so happy, and I'm still happy. Amen. <laughs> You can ask a question or comment, right? Yeah. How y'all doing, first and foremost? Uh, my name is Ron Hawkins. I'm a policy advisor with the Community Relations Service here at the Department of Justice, where I actually own like my office's youth portfolio and like deal with our youth policy. Um, a question for the entire panel, but Noah specifically, because I know that he personally can attest to this. Um, and for background, his, his grandmother's not lying. I've known him for almost a decade now. <laughs> but. Um, just to touch on briefly the importance of a young adult's presence in a younger person's life and how that can also help to change the tide or any combat any negative stereotypes or disparities that's facing like that, um, that youth member of the community. And personally, Noah and I have ran a, um, a mentorship program with our local elementary school when we were both in high school. And we personally saw the impact of even being 16, 17, reaching out to a 16, 7 year old, what impact that had in their life. So just tidbits that you all can give the crowd, that you could personal anecdotal moments, whatever you want to share. Um, well, personally, I can say that gaining uh, education on mental health helped me a lot uh, with my younger brother, both of them. Um, and they're like four years younger than me. Um, so they're, they're a lot, like she said, they're just being boys, but sometimes you're like, oh my God, sit down. Um, and what happened was my little brother had an experience with an opioid, which led to him having a psychosis episode. Um, and in that moment, it was really hard for him to build or trust others, um, but it gave me an opportunity to really be able to help him really understand, like, hey, this doesn't define you. Like, he came up the street having an episode, and I was like, wait a minute. Gave him a hug, showed him the love that he needed. Um, and I feel like that one situation has helped me so much um, in my life with helping out my peers. Um, and so even when I go to, uh, we have a safe house that we go to, one of our sites where we're storing Ivy Collective at night. Mama Joe can tell y'all, call him, but I'm just getting off work. It's 830. Girls, you don't go in the house. Um, but we have a lot of little kids that come to this class. And, I mean, they're really young, like, ranging from, I want to say 12 to 2, I get toddlers, newborns, because um, it's a mommy's group. And when I say they are so elated to see me walk through the door now, when I first came, they was like, you're not going to be here next week, are you? And I was like, okay, I'm seeing flags of abandonment or whatever the case may be. But now, literally, like yesterday, we reached our 14 marks of uh, completion of group or programming, and I was like, what if you guys learn? I mean, they're going back to when we did music therapy. They're going back to when we did many mock interviews. They're like, yeah, I love this class. So I've seen it be impactful in a way where it lights their day up. They love when I walk through, and they're like, that's the innovative art lady. Well, they call me the art therapist, but I have to keep saying I'm not a therapist. <laughs> We're only painting. Um, but 
I feel like it's really important for the younger people to have peers because they get to have somebody who they're inspired by. Be like, oh, okay, not only do I want to be an astronaut, I want to be the next to my land, you know? So just being an inspiration, but also being able to teach them like how to wash their hands and give them those life skills because we assume that people gain life skills from their parents or we assume that, oh, because she came from a good household, she knows all of these things. But for me, it's like I'm going to make sure that we all know it. So if I'm reiterating it, it's fine. But if you're just learning, it's fine. To, um, and teaching them manners. A lot of them either have manners, but then it's an age gap, right? So when you got kids that are like eight and then you got a 12 year old, the eight year old, like, oh, she grown. And I'm like, no, I'm being mature. But again, it's all about the development of our brains and where we're going as kids. So it's really dope to be able to give that light back. And a lot of my mentors have kids as well. And they're like, I need you to take her. I need you to talk to her. She, Because sometimes parents get flustered and you don't always know how to communicate certain things. And so for me, I was like, what's going on, girl? And she was basically telling me, like, I'm going through womanly changes and I don't want to communicate that with my mom. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm here. We can talk about it. So just being blunt, like, it, it, it really changes is the perception of a lot and it helps them understand like they don't have to be perfect or have it all together because when you're watching the dog growing up you're like oh, I want to be like them I'm going to drink coffee I'm kind of helps them slow down a little bit and just be like, okay I'm being a kid and it's okay for me to just be a kid so um, that's how I look at it I hope I asked the question yeah Audi um, I do want to add to um, there's uh, for me I think oftentimes too why I will go to younger individuals is because um, I get frustrated with like my older side of the family because of the way that they think. Um, like for an example, um, my my younger brother, um, like he's struggling with mental health and he's like reaching out continuously, continuously, and like it's just like doesn't exist in a Hispanic household sometimes. So it's like you don't do that, you don't go through that. Like it's not real. Like it's just you being you, um, um, being like delinquent being not listening um and like i like another example was for me is my uncle was continuously disrespecting me like about to hit me put put his hands on me um and yet i was the one who got in trouble because i told him that i didn't care who he was that he was not gonna disrespect me um and it was simply those words and i was the one who was getting in trouble after he said he was going to do x y and z and and so it just blows my mind again it's um it's Sometimes it's those barriers of, of breaking traditional um, thoughts. So. Uh, Jaron, to answer your question, try to make it quick. I, I think, and, and if I'm internalizing correctly, I think it's uh, you, you're mentioning mentorship and the part that and the role that plays uh, with young people. Um, I'll I, I harken back to a little bit of our experience, but also um, me having a nonprofit. <laughs> It's such a it's such a funny world because I'm 27. Uh, I've been out of school now since 2019, so four years, um, and I have so many mentees. Like I have so many mentees. It's actually ridiculous. Um, in my organization, uh, we focus on um, developing student leaders and and molding um, young people to create. Uh, impactful service experience. And so what that looks like is we have about uh, eight chapters, um, seven in Atlanta, one in the University of Miami, uh, over 700 students in our database uh, with about 90 executive board members, so like 90 leaders who are in place of these chapters to run. It's collegiate-based. And so um, that's a wide range of people to work with as a 27-year-old with a few other jobs. And so, and I'm, I'm working with primarily 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds. And so, you know, I'm big bro or I'm big homie or I'm, I'm some conversations I'm unk. And so, uh, and that shirt for uncle, I don't want to do, I don't want to do a brief, that shirt for uncle. And I think it's so funny because, um, the, the beautiful thing about that is, right, we're able to create such a pipeline of service and leadership and friendship and love and support. Um, some of the people that you may see around me, uh, you know, we, we just call each other brother, sister, or, or, or cousin, or because we have that extended relationship. But the work they've been able to do um, 
from meeting them as freshmen to now being a one or two years out of undergrad, I mean, their growth emotionally, professionally, mentally, spiritually is astronomical. And, you know, I wrote down in my notes earlier, sometimes your, men- your mentorship would extend to people you would never meet. Um, the, the way you've shown up in some people's lives, you may never actually experience that reciprocation of benefit, but the people you touch and impact, what they go do, um, how they go change other people's circumstances and lives is um, completely impactful. Um, my, my, I had a friend ask me the other day, you know, who's the greatest impact what woman had the greatest impact on you outside of like your mom, your grandmother, like your family? And I had to, I had to, I, I had to really think about that because it kind of hit me a little different. I'm like, mm, not, there's a few ways I can answer this. It's a little dangerous question. But then I thought about it. I'm like, you know, Kateri Kelly is a woman who did not. Um, I had a White House mentor who gave me another mentor who gave me another mentor. And <laughs> and that's really how I went. I had one mentor who gave me another mentor. And now uh, maybe a month in, I got like three or four mentor, mentor, mentors. But I came out of that as a woman um, who, by the name of Kateri Kelly, who, um, man, I mean, she's such a beautiful soul and spirit. And I hope she gets a chance to see her here. I had to text her that and, you know, tell her how much she means to me. She was the reason the person that helped me get into Morehouse. And so... The domino effect that took, right, was was amazing. Um, when she helped me get into one program at Morehouse, that led me to another program at Morehouse, that led me to getting admitted into Morehouse, that led into, you know, when you watch the headlines, the, I think the Washington Post said, White House mentee goes to Morehouse. And I'm like, that is not the story whatsoever. You know, that was not, I actually missed our last uh, program with President Obama because I was in there fighting in summer school, trying to get into, <laughs> trying to get into um, Morehouse College. But, you know, she connected me with her brother, who connected with guys on campus, who showed me the right way to go about things, who then eventually, you know, I ended up joining their fraternity. Um, and, and, you know, I even spent, and my grandma told you, I spent every Thanksgiving with them pretty much since then. That was like 2016, 2015. And so that is just a story of one mentor creating other mentors and a domino effect of a village and a community. And I have so many different stories about different mentors who played a pivotal part of my life. But I think that as you guys, I'm pretty sure a lot of y'all are mentors or have mentees, but the people you touch and the lives you impact, you may never see or meet, but I promise you how far that love and that, and that support goes goes to hundreds or thousands of people who never know. If I, if, if I didn't go to Morehouse, let's, I mean, for I know for a fact 80,000 people want to have gotten meals, at least from me, <laughs> you know, or that impact wouldn't have lasted in that way. And that started with a simple woman like, you know, a Kateri Kelly. So uh, mentorship has played a huge part in, in, in my life. Uh, to answer your question, Jerome. And that is a really beautiful note for us to conclude on. I'm really, I don't want to end. This is so, this has been so rich and so powerful. And I just want to um, say on behalf of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, a, a big thank you to all of you for sharing your expertise, your recommendations, for being truthful with us and honest about things that we need to be doing and thinking about. And I also really want to thank our audience here. Um, I know it's been a long afternoon, but um, I, it, I, I can tell from everyone's smiles that you, you're walking away with a um, great experience um, with everyone here. So please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> Before you all leave, there are feedback cards that are over there on the table. Um, I believe it's labeled. I can't really see that well. But um, they're, I think they're in that little basket there. Yes, she's holding them up over there. Please fill them out, comments, questions, concerns that we may be able to, may be able to get back to you on. Please fill these out. We really love to be able to hear um, what you thought about today's session um, so that we can continue these um, conversations. So thank you.